a lot of credit goes to Anshu on this because this started in a bar with a few drinks. Paul <laughs> yeah. and Anand, and the next thing you know, here we are collaborating together. So yeah, I mean, really, Samir kept us all in check, though. So you have to, you know, absolutely. Yeah, I really, I mean, a lot of credit goes to Anshu on really, this uh, because this started great. in a bar so with a few we drinks. Have never, you know, see the light of day, but this is great. Yeah, thank you, Samir. Thank, thank you all. So, thank, thank you. All. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Yeah. This is awesome. So shall I start? We are live. Yeah. Yes. 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 Good. So good morning, everyone in India, and good evening, everyone in uh, America. And we welcome you all to this first uh, American Indian Shoulder Elbow Society and Shoulder Elbow Society of India meeting. And to introduce today's program, I hand over to our president, Dr. Ram Chidambaram. Good morning, everyone uh, in uh, India uh, from uh, greetings from Shoulder Elbow Society of India, and good evening to everyone in United States of America. Uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Suman Krishnan and Dr. David Rajan uh, to uh, start this uh, uh, relation of in Indian American Shoulder Elbow Society and uh, SESI uh, combined meetings. We had one meeting a few months ago, but now we are formally inaugurating our combined virtual meeting between the two societies. And the uh, uh, Indian American Shoulder Elbow Society has been uh, led by uh, Dr. Suman Krishnan. And now we have excellent uh, faculties as a group together from USA, uh, Dr. Uh, Anshuman Singh, Dr. Uh, Samir Nagda, Dr. Paul Sethi, uh, Dr. Uh, Ranjan Kupta, and uh, Dr. Vani Sabesan. Have we missed anyone? <laughs> Dr. Anand Murthy. So, <laughs> welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's uh, 9 p.m. here. Thank you for staying in this time uh, with us. And we have our faculty here, Dr. David Rajan and Ashish Papulkar uh, and uh, Karthik Selvaras. Uh, with that, without wasting much time, I will request Dr. Anshuman Singh to uh, talk about uh, IASES, Society Formation. And uh, hand over the program to Anshuman Singh. Thank you, Anshu. Please take over. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. I just want to briefly introduce the program uh, tonight. Um, we cannot see it. We can see. It. Maybe you can see it now. I just it's just the it's just the poster, really. Um, so I just wanted to again welcome everyone to the first combined meeting of the SESI and the IASES. Um, and I thank you for the introductions. I want to focus less on sort of our interests and really just talk, you know, about the mission and why we all came together. You know, this group really met a year ago at the Shoulder and Elbow Society meeting in New York. And, you know, we're all non-resident Indians. Our parents immigrated to the United States and we all kind of had the same desire to connect with our Indian brothers and sisters. And we thought what better way to do it than through, you know, our, our, uh, profession and, um, you know, when we reached out to SESI, that we were so happy that they were enthusiastic about um, about starting an educational meeting and more formal ties. And uh, you know, as such, I appreciate um, the faculty on that side um, for for meeting us halfway here. Um, so the format of this conference is going to be pretty straightforward. I won't take too long. We're going to focus on a few big shoulder topics. Um, one of the uh, faculty members will give an update from this year's shoulder and elbow meeting that was last weekend. Then we'll present thought-provoking cases that will allow for interaction between faculty members. If anyone in the audience has a question, please put it in the chat, either in the, the uh, live stream or in um, the Zoom, and I will actually ask it of the faculty members. And that way it'll keep the background noise to uh, a minimum. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Anand, who's gonna start with Rotator Cuff. Oh. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. I want to thank everyone again who organized this, and it's uh, such a great honor uh, to do this uh, this week and all the work everyone's put in. And I think the, the great technology that we can share now, we can do this even more often. So I'm going to give uh, an update uh, from the ASCS. Uh, I've been a member for, for a while now with some of our other com colleagues here, and we had a very good virtual meeting uh, last week. So 
I'm going to present some of the abstracts, some of the papers, uh, just really quickly. Sakati and his group uh, discuss margin convergence versus SCR. Uh, I hope we can discuss a little later how much SCR is being done uh, in India as well. Their conclusions were that the SCR is perhaps not as good a technique in their current study prospectively for massive rotator cuff tears. The, um, uh, the outcome scores were equivalent and obviously less costly than some of these expensive allografts that are necessary. So in conclusion, if technically reparable, they advocate doing the margin convergence partial repair uh, in their series compared to doing an SCR straight off the bat. Uh, the group out of Rothman, uh, we can talk a little bit about pain management. I know Paul is a, a big advocate for pain management. I'd like to understand what's done in India. In their group, they studied Tylenol or acetaminophen uh, as a pain control to decrease overall opioid consumption. consumption. Um, and as a pre-med, it, it significantly decreased the post-op opioid consumption as well. This study I was involved in as one of the um, investigational device exemption centers for a prospective randomized study on the in-space balloon uh, for the treatment of full thickness cuff tears. You can see they're at about uh, 25, 30 members across uh, the United States and Canada. Um, and they showed, and, and we sh submitted all of our data. Uh, we're over two years out now. We've uh, submitted to the FDA that all the endpoints on pain, motion, uh, and uh, patient reported outcomes all did well with very few, if any, complications. And this is a procedure that's very easy to do. All the outpoints, uh, endpoints had improvements, uh, especially in pain over time, even up to two years. So this will be a device that in the next few years we'll be seeing. I'm, I'm sure we've seen it. Uh, many of you may have seen it in Europe. Uh, and I'm going to end on this one, which was a long-term outcome out of, from our colleagues in Turkey with imaging on the clinical results of medium to large tears at 10 years. So really with imaging, a great study uh, that was published. Uh, they are hypothesized that the transosteous equivalent provide good outcomes and high rates of healing. And you can see only about 18% uh, had re-tears and very few had to be revised. 80% were satisfied at the 10 year mark, many of them back to sports and activities. So in their conclusions, 80% were satisfied, very good outcome scores with high healing rates on MRI um, at 10 years follow. So I think this is a great study for the literature for us to kind of discuss with our, um, our colleagues. So in the next, uh, I think I have about five minutes, I wanted to go over, um, actually I'll finish with Ty Lee, which goes into my talk. You know, in, in where Ty Lee, excuse me, where Mahata is doing his studies in Korea, uh, Japan, excuse me, they have a tremendous amount numbers of of his patients, we need to talk about, these are two different operations that are done there and here. There it's an eight millimeter graft. Here it's three to four millimeters, auto versus allo. So it's difficult to, it's almost like apples and oranges. So hopefully we can discuss that as well. But they, obviously he had a great success in his SCRs, utilizing his autograph technique of getting people back to work and sports. With regards to early repair, you know, we always talk to our patients who get traumatic tears. Personally, myself, I like to treat these patients relatively soon. Um, and Dr. Ramsey and their group at Rothman studied this. Inclusion, acute cuff tears, surgical repair within 12 months. And all of them improved if those patients were within that four month of injury zone, both in ASS, ASCS scores and improvements in SST scores. So their conclusions were the larger and more debilitating the cuff tear that were repaired earlier, they did better. So uh, getting it within four months, I like to get to it within four to six weeks, similar to the old Cofield studies. Uh, I think it's almost like a fracture. The sooner you get, the easier it is to repair and rehab them without getting into complications and stiffness. I wanted to show a couple cases of some of the newer uh, techniques we're doing. This is a, uh, a revision cuff repair. You can see relatively large. Uh, I've been using bone marrow aspirate. This is a system that allows you to take it from the humeral head. Uh, standard transosseous technique. We use a resorbable uh, PLA graft to reinforce on all our revisions, and we slide it down through the through the cannula, and then we can add the bone marrow aspirate in a revision case over 60 years of age. Obviously, multiple things that are going to decrease their healing rate. And you can see here at two years, we're doing imaging that shows that this patient has healed. So instead of just doing a cuff repair again, I try to do some type of augment to stimulate healing. 
Uh, and this patient, she's a, an awesome young woman, uh, very active, unfortunately has developed Parkinson's. So part of Parkinson's is maintaining your physical therapy and your activity. She had a failed cuff repair, complete atrophy, a lag sign, tendons medial to the joint line. So in these cases where they're very active, um, and we'll talk with our Indian colleagues if, if this has made it to India and how they're doing with the lower trapezius. It's a relatively very straightforward procedure. It's an arthroscopic cuff repair on one side and then a pulver taff weave on the other side. And once you can learn how to harvest the trapezius, it makes it a really simple, it's really about an hour case. Uh, and I think if we can teach each other these techniques, which hopefully this society will do, we can um, show, show each other what types of techniques we can use to improve our, our patient outcomes. And so this is just the pulver taft portion to the Achilles with the arm in full abduction external rotation. This is her at, uh, at again, six please. months. Uh, it was unique this in that you can smart. actually see, if you get really close, you can see the Achilles tendon graft. Good. Um, right and below just the hang there for me as well, please. So that's her graft on the right side. And this is her MRI at six months. We're following these way. And you can see that very thick black line. That's the Achilles tendon graft feeling. The balloon, um, I really hope this becomes uh, available. It's about a five minute procedure. This was a randomized study. You can see pre-op and post-op the increase in the chromiohumeral interval. It really takes about three to five minutes. I mean, in Seti's case, maybe a half hour. Uh, Bonnie, maybe 30 seconds. She's really talented. <laughs> And um, it inflates, there's certain size and certain amount of volume you have to put in, but these are really simple to do. Very little downside, doesn't burn any bridges. Go ahead and raise your arms up. And this is actually this lady at about three weeks Good. after surgery. Down. Keep your elbows straight. We had done nothing but done the balloon. She had been immobilized since then. Keep your elbows straight. And so we had performed a biomechanical study that had shown that we can recreate the normal using utilizing the balloon. So. That's my talk in a nutshell. I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, we really like, or I personally like a lot of novel techniques and would love to somehow, somehow visit India and uh, show you guys some of our uh, new stuff from here. Thank you. I think our next talk is going to be from Ceci. We're going to do a case yes, discussion. Thank you. Can you uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So th thanks, Alan, yeah. for uh, uh, giving a very uh, nice, illustrious uh, review about the rotator cuff. Uh, so let me uh, start. Uh, so I just uh, set up my own uh, center for uh, ortho specialty clinic at the heart of Chennai in uh, Albert Pitt uh, a few weeks ago during the pandemic. And now I'm affiliated to MGM Healthcare as the Director of Institute of Shoulder, Elbow, Hand and Sports Injuries. So let us uh, discuss this case. There's a 49-year-old gentleman from West Bengal. Uh, he's happy to show his uh, details and as well as his pre or post op videos. He's an ex-service man. He had been having some ongoing pain in the left shoulder, had a fall two months ago presenting to me with painful left shoulder, he can't lift arm, and impossible to do any ADL, and presenting with night pain. So that is his uh, range of uh, clinical uh, moment on the left shoulder, abduction around 40 degrees, and uh, forward flexion, uh, typical uh, pseudopanalytic shoulder with around 20 to 30 degrees of forward flexion. He has uh, preserved external rotation, there is no stiffness of the shoulder. Active external rotation is around 40 degrees. That's his clinical examination. Uh, passive movement is possible with pain. And when I leave the arm, it's a drop arm sign positive, indicating massive cough tear. Resisted external rotation is weak. And belly press test is grade four by five. So that's the clinical picture. As this is the MRI scan. I didn't have the x-ray here. The MRI scan. Uh, shows a massive retracted rotator cuff tear uh, with retracted down at the glenoid or uh, middle part of a chromium level with a very thin edge of the rotator cuff. That's the uh, pictures. 
you have the axial images on the top, on the top right? You could say there is uh, some upper subscapularis uh, tear with the thinning of a subscapularis tendon near the insertion, as well as some uh, coracoid impingement with the joint effusion. And uh, posteriorly, you have infraspinatus uh, edema as well. This is the uh, F1 uh, uh, SAG images showing the muscle fatty infiltration is only uh, grade one to two maximum. So that's better. Atrophy is present. So what is your take on this patient? Can we have a quick quote because we discussed about that. Would you be happy to repair the cuff along or augment your cuff repair or use a subacromial spacer? It's nice to see your randomized trials result. Uh, but that was that study was done when you don't do any repair, I assume. Or right. you do cuff repair, cuff repair with uh, uh, supplement with the superior capsular reconstruction, the buzzword now, or you resort to supplement with tendon transfer because it's 49 and you are repairing alone might have a higher risk of retail. Can you have a quick quote? And then I will show what I did to finish the case. Suman? Yeah, for me, I would just repair the cuff. Okay. Want to uh, reinforce or augment with anything? No, just repair. Okay. Unsure? Sumant, tr transosia, Sumant, double row, single row? Transosseous for me, all repairs for me, as uh, Anand knows, are, are transosseous repairs. So effectively compressing the entire tendon to the footprint. Okay. Unsure? Double row. Double row for yeah. me. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, for me, it's the same thing. It's a cuff repair alone, double row. Uh, usually I do a rip stop and a speed bridge. Um, kind of repair and I'll kind of uh, do some side to side with the intact cuff as well, but no augmentation for me. Okay, Sami? I'll be yeah, I would what, do, yeah. what if, if you look at during surgery after all mobilization, you have a little bit thin margin, unable to restore the footprint completely? But I just put Cori repairable, okay? Yes, Paul? So I, I think uh, I'm going to try and repair it like everyone else said. If, if you tell me that I'm not going to get there, if I can get the info back up and on. I'm going to go with number six. I'm going to add his own biceps up on anteriorly. That's a technique I learned from, uh, I learned in Ahmedabad uh, to use yes. the biceps. Okay. Ranjan? Um, I'm going to do a cuff repair alone. That's, uh, I, I do double row speed ridge, uh, just like Anshu said. Okay. Uh, Morning. Right. So I'll be, I'll be a naysayer. Right. So if it's irreparable, I mean, it's another story, but I would say I'd be the naysayer. We're doing a prospective randomized trial right now, looking at augmentation. So I might add some augmentation if I, if it were me to consider um, on top of trying to repair it. Okay. So Vani, why? 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 Because I, I, I think, you know, it's just quality versus quantity, right? So I think really it's the quality of the tendon that you've got. And, you know, perhaps there's not biology, but perhaps by just by having more biomechanical strength to tear through, we all know it's, it tears at the suture junction, right? At the suture to tendon pull through. That's the most common way of tears. So if you can add more strength in that tissue, perhaps maybe you could prevent that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I would go with a primary double row repair, but... My biggest concern is when I go in there, I don't have any investigation that tells me that this is supple, retractable, and it's not fibrosed. And that's my biggest worry. So in such cases, I always counsel them in advance. And I said, I might do a biceps tenodesis, the reverse augmentation with the biceps. And at some point, I would say I would do an SCR. But <clears throat> we plan an SCR and invariably end up doing a primary repair. But... Twice but, a year, I have to go in there and do an SCR. If I do one, it's going to be an IT band. Yeah. The uh, biceps could be used as augmentation or in an SCR mode. SCR mode. SCR, SCR mode. Yeah. Can biceps I just ask the panel too, does the subscap um, being superiorly torn affect your decision making in any way? Not if it can be repaired, man. It looks so, repairable to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. David Dozen? Uh, primary repair, yeah, of course. Karthik? Okay, Karthik? Assessment will be intraoperative. So intraoperatively, if the cuff is repairable, I'll go ahead and repair. But if there is uh, any uh, problem with um, loss of tendon tissue, there is no tendon, then just augment with longer biceps. Okay, uh, just to proceed, because I was concerned that he's a 49-year-old, he's very... Uh, 
uh, uh, ex service man he will be doing lot of uh, act, uh, activities but this is the patient the arthroscopy lateral position showing a massive retracted rotator cuff tear i have done the supraglenoid uh, release and the rotator interval uh, resection as you see in the mri there is a bit of a prominent uh, coracoid just done a little bit of coracoid plasty to gain some uh, freeness there and that is the upper subscap tear left foot type 2 so i just proceeded with the in, inside the box in situ repair of uh, subscap with the uh, double loaded anchor the sutures are placed that's the first set of sutures and um, and there's a criss cross manner that's the second set of sutures this is the simplest way to do a partial upper subscap tear and once it is done i'm just checking the excursion of the rotation so that's free excursion as good so now we are on the subacromial space that the, did a bursectomy Uh, and clear the acromion very minimal uh, anti anterolateral corner of acromion prominence so i just did a minimal subacromial bony decompression don't routinely do for all but then that is the cuff for you that's the supraspinatus and posterior infraspinatus so again uh, is uh, still uh, stuck so i just clear the uh, tuberosity area debride the cuff edge with that edge is not going to do much then did the subacromial release to gain some more length So at this point I didn't want to sacrifice the biceps no more french way so I decided to do a biceps scr so that's the group that again a double check preparation of the greater tuberosity use the retriever to relocate the biceps to go on the top of the greater tuberosity it should stay on the top it is staying nicely so I just push it back into the groove now you can attach it with an anchor but I like to make a groove to relocate in the new position and then put an anchor in the medial part of the groove i made and use the uh, three is a triple loaded suture anchor so i used the three uh, suture anchors to get the biceps to fix to the medial border one is a lasso loop and second is the simple loop and the third one is uh, through the biceps so all these things will uh, securely have uh, fixation of the medial uh, biceps at this foot point so i tie all these three suches and I cut one suture out okay so that's the uh, then, then i went went with the medial row anchor because i had thought that there is some increase in mobility after this but it is not fully covering the footprint but i decided to do a speed bridge type of repair without not tying on the medial side accepting that it will not cover completely on the uh, greater tuberosity so this is the uh, i used the suture from the uh, medial biceps scr anchor to take the medial bite on the uh, rotator cuff so that is the final medial repair and then secure lateral row i put the lateral row anchor next to the uh, tenodes the biceps and fix the uh, cuff in a double row manner with the speed bridge technique the posterior anchor i had the three sutures so i tied uh, one of the suture after i have done the uh, lateral row spine lock fixation so that's the second lateral row anchor to put in again you could say that probably you could have done that uh, and then uh, done a french way of biceps tenotomy but i thought that initially it may not be completely uh, uh, repairable cuff but it was at the end to just cover the footprint so that's the second anchor that's the last one final suture which i just tied so sort of a hybrid fixation after we have done the speed bridge technique so that is the end as you see there is a small dog hair in the anterior aspect so i just put a um, small push lock anchor to secure it out so that is the completed repair from the lateral view that's a biceps scr in a rerouted position with a double row cuff repair without tying not medially So that's the uh, active amount of rotation so I'm just taking 2 minutes long Ram I and that is the inside view that's the inside view of the repaired cuff and then that is the excursion which was is interesting to me like you know this is buckles but it stays very strong so this was done the month before lockdown uh, so I just saw him uh, only for one month follow up that's post operative this is came on day 1 post operative and uh, I usually don't put the patient in any sling of the top repair start to mobilize with assisted arm elevation pendulum movements 
So as usual, we allowed uh, uh, elbow flexion exercises uh, because I was really concerned that may be some restriction because of the rerouted biceps, but the tension is good. So that's the day one post-operative. So that's the post-op x-ray. And I saw him uh, one month post-operative. After this, the lockdown was announced, so he returned to West Bengal and he did exercise on his own. And he sent this video after two months, three months of uh, lockdown. He didn't have any formal physiotherapy. He was doing all his exercise on his own, range of uh, flexion, abduction, external rotation, and internal rotation of the left shoulder. And uh, he had been doing all his exercise ad hoc as he liked. So yeah. enough exercise, I thought... I thought he's just going to uh, sit. <laughs> <laughs> I was close to say, stop, stop, stop. He's bragging about your uh, performance, your technique. Yes. No. Oh, Ram, I, okay. love this. I love this technique. I had to go see a psychiatrist when I first learned it because I spent so much of my career trying to cut the biceps and now I save the biceps. My yes. question that I struggle with now is, do you need to release the biceps distal to where you've now relocated it, or can, do you leave it intact? Yeah, see, I think yeah. I, I agree, Paul. Uh, I, I have done a small series now, but if the biceps is good, if the biceps is good, I think we can uh, leave it rerouted position. But there are a lot of techniques, variation in the biceps ACR, uh, say that you could resect distally. But if the biceps is not good, distally, you could do a tenotomy. Let's just see quickly few slides. The biceps SCR technique. This is the Chinese way as described in uh, 2017, where they do a tenotomy of the distal biceps and repair the cuff. And um, this is the classical description, which I have done is the rerouted biceps, retaining the biceps in the entire. And this is the Chilemi technique, Italian technique of using transosseous sutures for uh, biceps SCR, but do a tenotomy at the end. And this is a double bundle technique from Rochester, uh, uh, 2018 published. And this is uh, last year's uh, snake technique where you have a triple bundle uh, biceps go back and forth, isolated SCR. And then we, uh, there's a decent description in June, uh, Scott Adrian and Larry Field calling this bio SCR because it is already there. So advantage is that autograft is readily available. There's no donor site morbidity. That is cost saving and less anchors because you have to fix only one end and biomechanically superior or at least equal and an aggressive rehab is possible as you see in the, my sample patient. But you need a good quality biceps attached to glenoid, but you need to know uh, the effect on biceps and long-term results to be known. Thank you. That's fantastic. Wonderful. Great technique. Now, Ram, do you always send people to physical therapy or what's your, well, how many people do you send to therapy and when? Uh, see, uh, in all my uh, uh, rotator cuff repair, we allow uh, early assisted range of movement, pendulum movements, etc. for the first month with no sling. Uh, the regular physiotherapy starts after one month range of movement exercises, the second month muscle strengthening exercises. So three months program. Okay. Yeah, here in the U.S., if I take someone out of a sling early, they'll just start doing everything they yes. want to. So absolutely, <laughs> a little, little less compliance here, I think. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Have you found any problem having this for six weeks? Uh, or say in, in this case, it's a large, large tear, retracted tear. Would you not want to protect your repair for some time? I think even in this, if you're... Uh... Repairing a double row of repair, if you're happy, you don't need to as a must necessarily put them in a sling for six weeks. But having said that, if you do isolated SCR, uh, we are used to protect the shoulder for six weeks. So I think when you do biceps with augmented with the cuff repair, uh, I don't think that is a, uh, that is maybe necessary. But anyway, we'll ask uh, other senior guys here. You know, Alex Latterman had a great paper of no sling versus sling, you know, for medium cuffs with no, no change in function, no change in healing rates. So I think the whole sling thing may be something we have to, to reconsider really based on what type of tear, what type of repair, how strong your repair is, um, and go from there too. I thought that was a really good paper. And uh, Marty, here's, here's a question for Marty, the group. Marty, Marty Berlain about 10 years ago did a, the first prospective study in the Canadian Olympic Society. It wasn't actually published anywhere except reported in Canada 
on sling versus no sling use. And there was no difference in their healing rate, uh, but there was a lot more compliance with patients using their slings in places where they could uh, be subjected to involuntary movements. For instance, out of the house, if they go to a restaurant in big crowds, so on and so forth. And we actually have adopted that now for the last uh, almost 15 years. As my Indian colleagues know, we only use a sling if uh, people are in an uncontrolled environment. Here's a question for, question for you, Ram. Uh, do you put the arm in a certain position when you do the bicep senodesis? Uh, no, the patient is on the lateral decubitus with the arm in the regular lateral decubitus fraction, about 40 degrees abduction. That's it. I don't touch it. Because I think that if you re root bicep, because there is a, a, a one case where I cut the biceps uh, to begin with, it was damn difficult to uh, fix the biceps, uh, cut biceps. So when you do a re routing, uh, you just slip it back and it is depressing the humeral head. So it stays there. That's awesome. Thanks. That's There's technique. another another concept I put on the chat is, so these are SCR reroutings, but there's also an anterior cable reconstruction. I think yes. Paul's familiar with it, you know, so, uh, Steve. so you're, you're, you're passing the sutures from the infra around the biceps to act as an anterior cable. And so I've done that. And, and I know Max Park was done. We're trying to combine our series, but like you said, you have to have a good biceps, um, it has to be good quality. But, uh, you know, we used to do a lot of uh, tenotomy of biceps. When you encounter or uh, tenodesis, then you resect the intraarticular portion of biceps. Maybe uh, it's a good alternative compared to an expensive SCR uh, and it prevents, reduce the uh, retire rate. Uh, possible, a lot of possibilities are there, but uh, we need to wait for the time. This and I think it's an important point because, uh, you know, the French have taught us you know, I'm a French trained surgeon. I was trained by Hawkins. Everyone cuts the biceps. But Ken Yamaguchi, 15 years ago, was the first to talk about the, the real need for the long head of the biceps. And if you go back to the studies of Nier, Dr. Nier very rarely tinnitus the biceps. And so it's interesting as we go forward. Uh, I was talking to Buddy Savoy a few years ago. And much as we do, and I'm sure many people on this is call do, we individualize the treatment of the biceps. Uh, just because you have a cuff tear doesn't mean the biceps needs to be treated. And I totally yes. agree with Ram and others that uh, augmenting the biceps uh, in the cuff repair can actually be very beneficial. Just shakes this foundation of, of the biceps as this pain generator and the biceps as being you know, pathologic. In, in fact, it's you know, and it's not even going to restrict motion. This is, this is, this is sort of a, a paradigm revisit, if it were. Yes. yes. Maybe Absolutely. we need to make this the Indian treatment of the biceps. The French cut it, the Indian save it. I, I also yeah. eat it. You repurpose it. Yeah, We're repurpose. Frug frug frugal, frugal. There you go. Repurpose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so next it's going up. to be Ranjan. Next. Ranjan. Yes. Okay. yes. I am starting. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, please. Okay, so good evening and thank you for the opportunity. I'm gonna follow suit with providing a, a second case uh, about a failed uh, rotator cuff repair. This is a patient, this is a 64 year old right hand down woman presented with right shoulder pain, limited range of motion, no trauma. She had a high BMI. Um, her physical examination showed she forward flex to 120, abduction 110, external rotation of 30, internal rotation, PSIS. She had some weakness external rotation and a, and a positive empty can test. And so this, this, is, this, is, her, this is her MRI, her M uh, sagittal view. She sh shows that she had a, uh, a rotator cuff tear um, that was retracted to the level of glenoid, a gutalier stage two or three. Um, this is the first time I saw this patient. So in my, in my practice and in my, in, in, in my hands, uh, I'm going to send her to physical therapy for a while. Okay. I'm going to, I want, I want, I want to make sure that she's got her range, get, get a little motion. I want to get to know, I want to get, I want to get to, I want to get to know the patient. Um, she left my practice and went to, and went somewhere else and got a double and got, and went, went and went somewhere else. And her initial operation was done by an outside surgeon in, uh, in the community. The operative report said, that basically did a details of double row rotator cuff repair, um, six, weeks, six weeks in a sling. She then presents to me uh, with this. She, pre she, presents, she presents to me with sharp pain immediately on removing the sling. 
Now her forward flexion is market is mar, is is mar, is market is market is markedly reduced. Uh, she forward flex to 45 for abduction to 45, and now it looks like uh, you can see in all these all these views here, uh, le- almost like a bomb blew off in her shoulder. There are n- numerous anchors. Uh, there are uh, not a whole not a whole whole lot of t- not a whole lot of tissue that is there, and so. With in the in this patient, um, so these in in this patient, here are the options. This is just a different patient, and I, I apologize because I didn't know Anand was going to show this. But um, so, but these are options: are debridement, biceps tenodesis, subacromial decompression, a partial yeah. repair, margin okay. conversion, rotator cuff repair with graft, superior yeah. capsule reconstruction, a balloon, tendon transfers, or reverse. Uh, and these pictures are obviously of a of a lo- of a lower trapezius transfer on a different patient that gets a good outcome. So I'm going to go around to the panel and ask them what they did and what they would do so before I display what show what I did. So uh, we'll, 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 we'll start with um, uh, our host, Ram, what would, what would you do for this patient? Go ahead. Anshu, what would you do? Probably an arthroscopic assisted lower trap uh, with the Achilles allograft. Even for a, for a 64 year old with large BMI, this is aspect. Um, you wash out you, the pus first. What's it? You wash out the pus first. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Great question. Um, Anand, you? I mean, I'm, I'm looking at potential osteo. There's a big fluid effusion there. I'm going to do an infection workup. It looks like she may, I, I don't remember if I saw an x ray, but. The entity of rapid osteonecrosis after cuff repair. So I'm going to look at all of those things before I'm okay, uh, putting in a graft. Mm-hmm. 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 Can I talk to you I gave it away, unfortunately. Paul, what would you do? I would do exactly what Dr. Murthy has suggested. I'd probably scope and just make sure she's not infected. And then I'd do exactly what you did. So you two are both very smart for the first time in the same day. So I'm just going to go. So I, I did scope it. It was, it was infected, uh, clean, clean, cleaned her, cleaned her out. And then, uh, then after she had an infection protocol, um, there was no cuff tissue left behind. So I did a reverse shoulder on her and this is three, this is three months, three months after her reverse. So can I just understand, uh, what, what is a appropriate infection protocol duration time, subsequent need for biopsy or any of those things? Yeah. yeah. Did you put a spacer in there also? So the, so the, that's a great question. So multiple, t- so series of two, series of two washouts. First washout was to take out the anchors, assess, uh, assess, what, assess, assess what was going on, put her on, put her on, put, put her on uh, IV antibiotics. That was for six weeks. Did an antibi- did an antibiotic holiday for three months. Uh, so all the param- all the parameters, all the parameters were clean. Uh, at, at the at the three month time point, went back in. Did the did when I did the reverse. This did the reverse. Took some tissue. Took some tissue samples. Made sure that that the no, took five biopsy tissues for look at a number of fresh frozen uh, fresh frozen interoperatively confirmed before I put in the prosthesis that there was n- number of white blood cells was was not there. Then went ahead. Hey, Ranjan, can you go back? Can you go back to your X-ray with the anchors in place? Just your plain X-ray. Absolutely. Because there, there, there are a couple of telltale points here that uh, you know we have a lot of uh, younger surgeons who are here uh, on this call with us. And just going back to the plain X-ray, even before your MR scan, before. <laughs> uh, if you had it, I don't know if you just had the MR scan. I just there, have the, I just have the MR scan because okay. the the actual the uh, the plain X-rays were actually benign. You know, if you actually magnify the plain x-rays, you know, the, the instance of osteolysis around anchors is, is not an unreal phenomenon. In the radiological right. literature, it's uh, 31 to 60%, depending on the type of anchor. And, you know, we, we transitioned from titanium anchors to peak anchors or radiolucent anchors just so we don't see them on x-ray. But we can see the effect of those. And, you but, know, as, uh, as this we've was talked, a this was a standard, not to mention companies, but uh, yeah. commercially available kit with peak anchors uh, uh, placed. There, there were six anchors placed. 
Yes. And in almost all of the peak is made by one or two companies, you know, Dynaflex or Teleflex. Yep. And so, you know, the point being that you can see a lot of, uh, of pathology in and around the bone of the tuberosities when you have multiple anchors in place, especially if you see radiolucency around that. And that's a, it's a point that, uh, you know, we've unfortunately uh, had to deal with, you know, in our other iteration as arthroplasty surgeons, because the tuberosity is not normal. And whether we, we believe the Mazaka studies that, uh, you know, most of the healing of the cuff comes from the, the uh, you know, all of the factors within the bursa and UTOF and whether it comes from the bone, it's a combination. But if the bone's not normal, it's really, really difficult to get the cuff to heal to that. So just for the younger surgeons who are on the call, pay a lot of attention to your x-rays, especially in India, it may not be as cost effective to get an MRI scan, but really magnify and look for changes in radiolucency osteolysis around the anchors themselves as hallmark signs that perhaps the bone's not normal. And uh, you... Ranjan and Suman, yes, yes. Uh, we know that the infection rates with a primary reverse are high. In terms of a revision reverse are going to be probably higher and perhaps not in the immediate aftermath of the surgery. How do you counsel a patient and what are the chances? How do you look for future infection, it could be two years off, three years after surgery. So those are, those are, those are great questions. The, what I used was, so the, the period of time, the, I, I think we got, we got the patient early. It was not, it was not a virulent organization. It was, it was not a QD bat factor. Okay. It was, it was a combination of staph strep. It was, so um, from the period of time when, from six weeks, immediately postoperatively when, when it tore out, and I saw the I saw the patient. I had a high high, high suspicion for an infection. Went in very clean, did a very aggressive debridement, cleaned everything out, put the patient on antibody, and then at the end of the six weeks, the patient was on an antibody was on an antibiotic holiday. Those three months, the param, the the blood parameters went down quite significantly. Now, the, have I have I eliminated it entirely? Of course not. And you know, if she has any pain, if she had, and I and that was the caution was that listen, if I can not do this, but this is the only way I'm going to get, I know I'm going to get you the motion that you want. And if I need to go back and revise it, we go back to revise. If she has, and she was cautioned that she has a higher rate than most, but if she, if she has in fever, chills, nice sweats, any, any, anything of the, anything of the sorts, um, come back sooner and we'll, 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 we'll assess it. Uh, this is this, this case, as you can see from the mass, she is, she is, this is right now, she's three months post, post-op. So, uh, in the next couple of years meetings, if I did the wrong thing, I'll be sure to tell you. No, but Ranjan, I think you, you absolutely, you absolutely yeah. did the right thing. And, and to speak to, to Ashish's point, you know, when we first started doing our reverse arthroplasties, we didn't realize that there really was a real incidence of a potential infection after soft tissue repair. And now we realize with modern contemporary implants, with a primary reverse arthroplasty and no previous surgery, the incidence of infection is no different from any other implant. But if there is a soft tissue, that instance goes from less than 1% to probably somewhere in the order of 3%. So I think the suspicion, you know, we all speak about how to diagnose infection. I mean, you guys have done some great studies. Everybody on this panel has, but it's a clinical suspicion. And there's nothing wrong if there is a clinical suspicion with perhaps treating it as if it's an infection going otherwise. Anders Eklund years ago said, if in your heart you believe it's an infection before you put a reverse arthroplasty or any arthroplasty in, treat it as an infection. Hey, <clears throat> Sumant or Paul, do you do anything different on a revision? So I'll use Vanco powder, I'll do a debridement, betadine wash, anything like that? So I, I'll take that one on. Or Ron or David or any of our colleagues do anything different on a revision? You know, we, we have studied actually the use of either uh, some type of a tricalcium phosphate bead, you know, not to use a company's name, but an osteocyte bead laced with a vancomycin powder versus a tobramycin powder versus a vancomycin powder versus betadine irrigation versus peroxide. And it seems to be that the most effective treatment for any cutibacterium infection or anything else is actually just a peroxide irrigation on all the layers and a deep vancomycin powder. So I, I, I might honestly, consider a little bit. I, think, uh, Go ahead. I would uh, just say, you know, not that there's any science, but consider prolonged antibiotics post-op too. Not that, you know, but maybe right. hoping right. that you might do something to, to treat that if. if right. So I, 
I, I made the decision at the, at the first pick case that I'm going to do as aggressive of a debridement as I possibly could. And when I, when I, when I did that, the aggressive debridement and took out as much tissue, I knew I was not going to be able to do any sort of uh, rotator cuff repair. Yes. When I went, and with the fact of the matter is when the parameters came back down so readily after taking out the tissue and, and response and with the antibiotic holiday, I had comfort level and 3% is something I could live with. And not uh, to take, more, not to take more time, one, one question to Ashish, because, you know, Ashish, what Vani brought up is, is so important. Here in the United States, we can easily prescribe oral antibiotics. We fight with our infectious disease and primary physicians, but insurance companies pay for it. How is that in India? Is it possible for you to prescribe long-term, you know, three months or even six months of prophylactic doxycycline or minocycline to patients? Oh, After yes, our- That's not a challenge at all. Uh, we can do that. And uh, we are not bound by insurance or other limitations. And that's frightening because there can be a reckless use of antibiotics. Uh, mm-hmm. The point I wanted to break about, bring about And what was very disconcerting is patients turn up after three years and five years with an infection when everything was going fine. So although it's it's a small percentage, I think any pain that is unexpected or when it was not there and has come back should be treated as a potential infection in these revision high-risk cases. So they need to be worked up aggressively. So I absolutely agree on that point, Ashish, because in uh, India, the... uh, you had to review the patient if you do an orthoplasty because in the US and the UK, the patients are automatically followed up in the system. But in India, the young surgeons who do reverse shoulder for such conditions should follow their patients up. I have we, one question. Uh, actually, uh, Ranjan. we send all of our patients in the US to Ranjan if they have infection concerns. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> Ranjan, uh, my, my mic was uh, muted, so I couldn't answer you. Uh, but I have one question. What about restoring rotation in this patient? Because when you go for this failed cuff repair, you had to debride all these things that infraspinators, almost most of the cuff is gone. So did you need to do anything to restore external rotation? So uh, I think with the, with the fourth generation implants, as we were talking about recently, as well as the fact of how implant positioning, um, I, don't, I don't necessarily do a tendon transfer with every patient. This is, uh, she was not, it's not something that she had her teres minor was intact. Exactly. Um, and so I, I would, that was the primary thing that I was checking. She had, she, if she had, did not have her teres minor, I would have done a consider doing a tender transfer with it. Okay. But Thank with you. this one, I didn't need to do that. So, we so can, we, can we move to the next session? But the yeah, literature is yeah. controversial uh-huh. on tendon transfers after the reverse. You know, we've seen right. some benefit, and, and, not necessarily a ton. Right. And then the only other thing to add is I wanted to, you know, I wanted to get as much as I could from this one as I, without uh, increasing burden, right? So it worked well. Uh, let's head, I think it's time to head to Vani's session. We'll go from there. I'm going to, I'm going to unshare. Unshare. Thank you. There's one, uh, the one question came through. I think that's reasonable. Sorry, I was yelling at my kids, so I didn't see the MRI that obviously shows it's infected. I feel a little embarrassed now. Anyway, but um, uh, someone asked, when would you choose, Anand, when would you choose an SCR versus a balloon if you have the availability of both? Uh, oh, I think the, the balloon in the right case is going to potentially trump any use of the SCR. You know, I think... But when would you choose like one versus the other? I would use an SCR in almost very few. I would use the balloon almost all the time when it becomes available. It's going to be much more expensive, much more less morbidity much easier to use because a, bat, a poorly put in SCR is a disaster. Sure. You're talking about 10 anchors and, and a graft. Yeah. Um, and I think the indications will be very similar. And as, a, as Ram said, I think we've done some biomechanics work, uh, putting it on top of a massive cuff repair too, essentially unloading the stress on it. So we'll be using it there too. But yeah, Arne, what do we so tell our patients? What do we tell our patients about the balloon? What do you tell them? I mean, like what, what are our expectations? Uh, well, in the ID study, they actually weren't, weren't even allowed to know until the very end what they, what they yes. had gotten. But I think, uh, you know, what I'm going to tell them is it's got low morbidity. It's outpatient. There's, we rehab them like a decompression. They're going to have a sling on just for comfort. Um, the chance of it moving or, or dis- moving out of the way uh, or dislodging are very low. And actually can be done in Europe. It's been done repeated. You know, if it 
It dissolves in about 18 months, excuse me, about six to eight months. Uh, sometimes it retains its bursal layer, um, but you can actually, you know, docs have been doing it multiple times. So if I have a 50 year old who needs a reverse, who's got a Terry's minor, an infra, I'll probably do a balloon versus doing a, a reverse. I think it would be very interesting to see the results of uh, your results of in space balloon. Uh, because uh, I have used few, I have done few cases in England 2010. Uh, right. after the, uh, in India, it's not yet to come. It's yet to come. It's not approved yet, uh, available. Uh, so I think it would be interesting to see. It's a good device, minimally invasive. Right. And it doesn't burn any bridges, so I can't wait for it to be used. Yeah, I really get annoyed when they say SCR doesn't burn any bridges because to the point you guys made, there's a lot of foreign substances there in the tuberosity and it sometimes makes your reverse more difficult. Absolutely. Actually, there's a recent paper about that. Yeah. All right, Bonnie, your turn. Arthroplasty. I want to just say that I'm really proud of us for being on time. Um, anyway, so the Anand gave a really great summary of the cuff side. I'm just going to give you a brief summary of the last week's meeting, some of the highlights that are arthroplasty related. Obviously, it's a two-day virtual meeting. Korea was our GAF nation. What did we learn? What did we take away specifically in terms of arthroplasty? And, you know, I think there were four best papers. There were eight total best papers presented. There was one, two sessions, and four of them were related to arthroplasty. Well, actually, three. And so I'm just going to summarize what these best papers really sort of talk to us about. So the first one um, was patient satisfaction and outcomes of reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And it was a minimum of 10-year follow-up, which we really don't have in the United States nearly as well as some of our European colleagues. And so I, I really think it was surprising and, and, and uplifting to know that the outcomes are better with our newer devices, our modern implants or designs in terms of the innovations that benefited our outcomes with a 90% outcomes or survivability rate at 10 years. Um, there was a prospective blinded randomized control trial looking at stemless implants. You know, when people get bored and our outcomes get so good, we just decide to innovate more and more with other devices. And so I think stems have become a real point of discussion in terms of the humoral side. And they found that the stemless devices seem to do as well as the humoral implants and the stem devices as well. Well, one personally to me was, you know, looking at midterm out results and really actually they had five-year results of outcomes for radiographic of anatomic total shoulder. And this was at the central peg, as um, many of you know and have seen this, where sort of a quarter lock or whatever central peg is larger and then peripheral pegs. And they sort of had surprising results that weren't as good as they expected. This whole idea of the biomechanical, and if you look at the dog studies of ingrowth in these central pegs, really didn't pan out for these radiographic studies from these outcomes. And they found that there was less central ingrowth and actually more lucency around them. Although it didn't cl clinically translate, there was really no increased failure rates, outcomes were as good. The last one was on anti-inflammatories and, and rotator cuffs. And, you know, surprisingly, they had less narcotic use um, and really no um, safety or, or increased failure rates with that, which wasn't really arthroplasty. There was eight ACL, ICLs related to arthroplasty. I'm just going to briefly give you guys a highlight of them. One of them is on the humoral design, on the humoral side. You know, how much stem is really needed? And really, stems are getting shorter. Apparently, less is more. I'm a female, so I can put this slide up here with um, no modesty. But the bottom line is it's getting sexier to do less STEM. And then really uh, a lot, uh, two of the study or two of the thing uh, sessions talked about the idea of preoperative planning, innovation, whether it's GPS, every company is sort of coming up with it. They called it the clash of plans, which I thought was a really nice play on things. It started off with a, it was pretty good data, was interesting. There was a survey sent out to ASCS members in 2019 and interestingly enough, 70% of the members at that time were using it for some sort of planning. And I think probably by now it's even, even more an increased rate. What, what's the point of planning? You know, what's the idea and what can it benefit us? Really the idea of CT planning is maybe we can do a better job of decreasing or preventing glenoid failures, whether it's better implant selection, better understanding of the pathology and how to correct it better implant fixation, better backside coverage, or less risk of vault perforation. Ultimately, the bottom line is, where are we today? We've got a lot of different softwares, different platforms. Everybody seems to measure this deformity differently. Some are automated, some are manual, some are a combination. Different systems offer different solutions. And so the problem is, 
we don't really have a consensus on this and we really don't understand and different surgeons approach things differently. Whether it's augmented, short stems, what you wanna talk about, the bottom line is there's really not a lot of consensus on this technology. And then there were three ICLs talking about um, revisions, failures. We just touched on it. Infection's a huge part of it. Um, although it's a small percentage, it can be devastating for our patients and very difficult to treat once you become positive. And the bottom line is, it's really with increased arthroplasty volume being done, we are going to see more and more of these revision surgeries in our practices. And it's a cost versus you know, outcome of relative discussion. And then there were two that probably are more specific. I don't know in India, and I think it'd be interesting to hear from our colleagues in India whether this is an issue at all. But in the US, really, there's a push to do less for more. So less money, less cost, and keep your outcomes do better. And that's really an interesting discussion. And I don't know if our colleagues internationally feel that push. Um, Nir was honored by Dr. Bigliani. This was the you know sort of guest speaker. And then finally, we ended with some symposiums. Although there were four main symposiums, interestingly enough, one, some of them were on biologics, but really there was only one on symposium on arthroplasty. But the bottom line is the outcomes, the papers, the symposiums talk about the younger crowd and the older. You know, we're expanding our indications and that's clear. Three live surgeries were performed. Um, and I think that these are interesting because they're arthroplasty, but they all touch on sort of innovations. The first one was really interesting, was on flex them with a mixed reality. Um, so that innovation, the idea of, you know, computer innovation technology in the OR is really an interesting translation. Short stem reverses what we just talked about, augmented options, and then a stemless device. So we've kind of touched on these, but that that's the bottom line. And so where are we going in the future? I think I just wanted to highlight for our Indian colleagues sort of some interesting technology that was put out there. It's really not available and that was to me very innovative. And one of them is the virtual technology, the idea that we could virtually create this platform to train and teach not only residents, but future surgeons on new technologies as they come. The interactive idea of that experience and Precision Orthopedics has offered this and presented this in more of a cost um, innovative solution so that it's not costly for residency training programs for surgeons to obtain this. And then AI, the idea of big data can guide us on preventing and treating customized ways to solutions for our patients. The idea of taking this big data, real data that exists, so all the companies they are doing big um, databases, is that maybe we could customize them so that when we sit with the patient, we could say, this is what your predictive motion is. This is what your pain will be. This is the exact risks that you personally will have. And this is based on well-published data. And they're talking about this by taking a lot of data, providing it, and creating more predictive models. And I think it's really neat because they partnered with a technology company to do this. And this was an exact tech um, specific symposium that was produced. But I think that other companies that basically our colleagues right now have produced the exact same thing. Um, and some of them actually on our panel and provided this to AS, AAOS as another option. So the future is bright for arthroplasty. I thought it was really interesting and a great meeting to touch upon some of these things. So I'm gonna then leave it and head it to Ceci for helping us. And I think I'm gonna um, unshare it, allow us to start with some of the um, cases that are to be presented. Can I ask a question, Vani? Of course, please. Yeah. So. What is the trend to using uh, PSI for glenoid planning? It's interesting because I was trying to look at rates that if they were um, asked in that survey, and there was, but the data wasn't really great. But there was something of a 30% rate was one of the things that Moby Parsons, the guy that sort of put the symposium data, talked about. Um, I think there's a lot of logistical things in the United States. So, I mean, my colleagues can talk about this on and I mean, Paul, you guys all are part of this, but you know, there's a timing for technology of availability. Most of the turnarounds are at least four weeks. And then second of all, there's a cost to it. So it depends on where you're doing it and the availability of it. But both of those are significant factors that I think have impacted PSI. Everybody likes the idea of planning, but not that many people use PSI. And it has not increased over the years if you look at it. Um, I try to. Uh, I can I can talk a little bit about PSI. The um, you know there's different types of PSI in different companies, but 
you know, a lot of it comes down in the U.S. to negotiating your bundle of how much you're going to pay for the implant and the PSI. Yes. And so, you know, we've gotten the PSI guide. I try to get a guide for every case now because uh, I really believed if you're doing the planning and then you don't get the guide, you're really trying to just try to hit a spot that you might see on your computer what you've done. You'll get some type of idea. But if you're going to do the planning, then you might as well use the guide. So uh, we've gotten it down to pretty low cost, so we, as well as the implant. So that's not really a big factor now, but the time is a factor. So it takes at least now two weeks for the guides I use. Now, if you use the system where it's uh, truly um, uh, guided personal navigation, uh, exact tech, then you just need the CAT scan and it's, uh, you can do it the day of surgery. And I think that really is the future because it gives you so much more options intraoperatively as well. Yeah, with the, since George is here and then I can ask George, Paul, George. Anand and Suman, um, What's your experience with augmented reality and how effective do you think it is to further your precision surgery? What are the advantages? I'll, I'll jump into this, Deb. I think, yeah. you know, the AR technology, the, the only time we're really seeing it now is with the exact tech system. Everything else is sort of uh, an onlay, right? And, and the question is, when, were we gonna, when are we going to have uh, – a more facile use of it. Uh, I think that the future of, of what we do uh, that will apply in all of our arthroplasties, getting the exact height and position and, and how much actually backside coverage is going to be there. So I'm excited to see what it will be in the next three to five years, but I don't know that, that we're, we're fully there yet in terms of user friendliness and, uh, and cost effectiveness. Uh, George, George, you want to give your comments, George? George, mixed reality, at the wall. George. Yeah. Hi, everyone. How are you? I've, been, I've actually oh listened for a while. Oh, my gosh. George, you're here. What's up, buddy? I've been here for a while. I'm just listening. Yes. George, you have the most ethnically correct background of the entire yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I think mixed reality um, and navigation is kind of like um, – fluoroscopy when we first started using it for hip fractures. I think a lot of people were very resistant to using fluoroscopy and just wanted to use a plain AP X-ray the hip. But now can you ever imagine going back to pinning a hip without some sort of imaging? So I think as the future happens, um, I think it's gonna become ubiquitous. I think uh, mixed reality, it's just essentially like a heads up uh, display our ability to navigate. Once it becomes cost effective, I think mixed reality is actually very cost effective. With a HoloLens is in reference to uh, a robot or in reference to an entire navigation system is mm. a lot cheaper. Um, but, you know, I think right now we're just at the infancy, as, as Paul mentioned, it's just starting. Um, but I think, so, that, and as Danny said, I think the future is very bright with it. So to add one point, um, so this year the, the ASCS Education Committee has been tasked both by Mark Frankel and Bill Levine to actually look at uh, AR and, and VR for surgical simulation, pre-op planning. And it's one of the initiatives that is going to be a multi-year project that uh, our society, the ASES is going to be actively working towards. And hopefully we'll have some answers for folks in the next couple of years. I mean, I tell them, we've been studying it in the lab, um, looking at mixed reality, augmented reality, looking at uh, navigation and they make, me a better surgeon, they make my residents a better surgeon, they make my fellows. The problem is we don't know what we're aiming for and we don't know if what we're aiming for is actually going to lead to better outcomes. I think like we all realize that the reverse is, is kind of like a total knee or total hip. It's pretty forgiving. You can kind of put it off a little off this way, a little off that way, and they end up doing okay. So in the end, we may find that we're splitting hairs, but I think we owe it to ourselves to try to get there first. I mean, if you have hairs, you can split. Thank you. Shall we move on? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ashish, please. Yeah. All right. So, good morning. This is a great honor and such a privilege to you know, see our brothers across the Atlantic. And I hope we will be able to conduct this on a more frequent basis uh, annually or uh, biannually. Uh, thank you guys for putting this through. Um, I think uh, it's very easy to mention about uh, DJD in patients younger than 50 years. And I think it looks simple. It's very easy to execute your uh, surgery. 
but to give them results and to monitor them is uh, critical and uh, the the responsibility and the onus lies on the surgeon to take it through for as long as possible so it's not an easy problem really speaking and minor errors can get augmented over a few years and lead to a major problem in later life uh, most of these are uh, recurrence due to cartilage injuries and poor anchor placements condylysis uh, we've seen a few avns and infections and i think those that last group is far more challenging uh, rather than the primary osteoarthritis which is not so common in india in the young age group we should not forget about rehab uh, because uh, that's an important uh, a part of treatment which can buy time and arthroscopy as well but i'll not delve into that my biggest challenge is these guys are young they are not as mature as the other patients and they want to do sports and have an increasing workload so before i start with my case i just wanted to make a plea that uh, have we laid the hemi to rest uh, a large part of europe has given up on hemi arthroplasties completely and uh, i don't think so because there's a there's a, there's a select group of patients which will deserve uh, hemi this is a 18 year follow up for a 65 year old lady and uh, she incidentally came because she had a rotator cuff tear on the opposite right shoulder after she had a road traffic accident and her left shoulder is still unharmed and she's doing pretty well with 18 years on this hemi arthroplasty i'm going to skip on the interposition part because uh, i don't think there's much value in there right now and not not a whole lot of solid evidence so coming to this 35 year old lady who's had a pain for over a year she doesn't remember any problem she's had with the shoulder and this is a isolated uh, monoarticular osteoarthritis which i thought could be rheumatoid but her blood markers were if he they were not clearly in favor of uh, inflammatory markers the mri was pretty quiet the luckily the t1 side showed very good quality muscle and that helps and if they come in uh, early when there's not much deformity on the head side then i think uh, it's a reasonable option to go ahead and uh, do a repair on them or uh, do a stemless uh, shoulder replacement this is a french device uh, made by a french company called evolutis or unic which is largely popular uh, in india uh, the whole thing is about balancing really speaking and to get the sizing right there is sizing is pretty complex because the base and the top need to be sized differently so it has to be uh, accurate and i do a lot of whole lot of intraop imaging before i know that my trial is uh, perfectly done and the cuff uh, has to be done in a proper parachute manner if i can do that then i know that these guys are going to come in with a good result and we match the heads to their sizes now this is our uh, patient who's 35 she's uh, 30 months follow up right now i'm hoping this video will play through i'm not sure about that for some reason uh, but she's done well uh, she's 30 months our longest follow up on the stemless has been 9 years and still well maintained uh um apologies here i don't know why this video wouldn't work but she's a she's a good result uh, almost full range of movement a ucl is about 32 out of 35 challenges of technology there uh sorry i'll just i'll just stop share and go back again uh, allow me that sorry guys okay so is my screen showing no no, no. no. i'll i'll just restart my share again okay so we'll skip yes. on that video yeah so uh just to show you that this is a lady who is the 9 year follow up this is the older version this is the cap from depu we stopped using this now because purely it's not available we've had great results on this and even she's done well uh, she's 9 years almost full range of movement size well no loosening yet but uh, this is a this is the point i want to make this is 2011 and this is 2019 now and you can see that the glenoid vault is slowly getting medialized now the biggest challenge is what do you do about that because the with is reducing progressively she's completely asymptomatic and she has no problem she has a full function 
and at some point she's going to come in for a revision which is quite right but when does one advise the revision and progressively it is going to start throwing out some wear material and uh, i'm hoping that the revision is not going to be too difficult with a stemless as opposed to a full lung total shoulder replacement uh, these are few articles about arthroscopy uh, very little on there most of them have a survival rate of about 2 years uh, 80% and then they start deteriorating uh, this is an article from peter millet who has a 85% survival at 2 years and then most of them will end up getting converted into a shoulder replacement it's a great idea to buy some time but the hemis uh, i think literature is not fair to them because there's a huge amount of loosening especially 38% at 10 years from uh, Jean, uh, walsh's unit and then uh, from uh, john sperling's unit although he had a 92% survival ship 47% were unsatisfactory so was there any point in doing a hemi on these so my biggest concern is uh, the hemis are getting a bad press but we've had a good run with hemis i don't have time to share all my hemi data in a select person when uh, you think it's appropriate and the cuff is good a weld and surgery will be fine luckily with the stemless is uh, available now i think our chances of doing the hemis are less likely but we need a very very close follow up because uh, these are these are going to come in for revision at some point but uh, the last point i would make before i close my presentation is what activity levels do you offer them because these are very young patients and they are very demanding uh, especially in my practice so with the stemless i am a little liberal with them and i allow them to play table tennis and golf and some of our hemis are also doing swimming activities uh, this is an article from bill melon uh, the editor from cs and uh, the, he seems to suggest that the european surgeons are far more conservative than the us surgeons our us colleagues can opine on that but certainly i am loath to allow them to do any kind of contact sports or weight lifting and uh, volleyball and basketball as such so in conclusion these are challenging patients uh, it's important to catch them early i don't think there's a big deal to talk about here because these are younger patients i find them much easier to rehabilitate giving them good results and full movements is not challenging the challenge is in the future what with the glenoid vault wear and what with the revisions uh, short term results though are good uh, in the long term they impact their reverse shoulders or would you be doing total shoulders after the stemless or would all of them be subjected to a reverse itself is a point that i would like to bring about for discussions thank you thank you very much i had a question about does anyone in india uh, consider doing the reman run that uh, rick matson has popularized uh, samir uh, yes good question uh, sometimes we are compelled to do that uh, we don't get a lot of young arthritis but if there's a deformity in the glenoid then i would prefer to do a reman run and do a stemless on them rather than do something more aggressive uh, but that's rare you know ashish i i firmly agree with you and you and i have had this discussion over the years that uh, the hemi arthroplasty has had uh, unfortunately a very bad reputation because of a few articles most notably as you as you reference john sperling's article but an anatomically done hemi actually with uh, peter millet and jp warner's uh, kinematic data replicates the center of rotation very well mm-hmm. and hence the the matson data Uh, on their long longitudinal outcomes of young patients under the age of 60 who had hemiarthroplasties versus total shoulder arthroplasties so i really do believe that we're starting to understand that we probably need to pay a lot more attention to the humerus than we did before whether it's with a total shoulder arthroplasty or a hemiarthroplasty or a reverse arthroplasty we spend so much time talking about the glenoid and glenoid mm-hmm. failures and glenoid version and glenoid inclination but the humerus is equally as important a construct and i think that that the hemiarthroplasty will indeed make a big comeback so uh, i have a question for you in india do you find that when you do the hemiarthroplasty the pain relief is satisfactory for your patients because that in addition to the other issues it really is a challenge like uh, in my practice and 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 many of my colleagues the hesitancy is not in a good surgeon's hand getting the balancing of the soft tissue but is the pain relief where you need it to be 
Yes. Right, Ranjan. Uh, I don't see a big problem mm-hmm. there because uh, we are just looking into our data on all the hemis and the total shoulders that we've done. And uh, yeah. we seem to have a fair amount of 16-year-old and 14-year-old follow-ups. Uh, there are a few patients who have a little bit of pain. Pain tolerance looks good. Um, and they are, uh, most of these are the ones who have been operated before for a putty plat and then come in with uh, arthritis. But the primaries that we've done on hemis because we got the stemless much later. So our first uh, volume of data is purely a hemi. And I've been loath to do a total shoulder in these young patients, especially in the uh, or, uh, 15 years back when we didn't have a good glenoid as such. And I don't have a problem with these. Uh, uh, the ones that are going to have a problem will deteriorate very rapidly within two to three years. But the ones who are 10 years off, 15 years off, suggest that we've maintained the center of rotation well. And so they've been balanced quite well and their cuff is good. Uh, they should run through their time. I yeah, think if we, uh, if uh, like, like Butch was saying, if they're centered, they're not posterior, and it's a small, well done, balanced hemi. I'll tell you, my partners who are older than their 60s, 70, I've seen their follow ups of hemis. They, they do really well, and they're even 10 years out. You do get the erosion <laughs> into the glenoid, which is a problem, but they don't need a revision yet, still. And it's yeah. been 10, 12 years. So I think we need to investigate that. So we're going to save the biceps. And we're going to go back to Hemi. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, my question is, most of us to do a Hemi here, but uh, is there any, uh, what is our take on a uh, biological uh, solution for glenoid? Oni can give you some update. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is the, the, the literature is not good on that. It's not favorable. I mean, there's been a number of studies that have sort of looked at this And I don't think the newer data is any better. And so the longevity of it, if you look, is really not durable. Although it does provide pain relief, I think the durability is really the issue there. What what about newer newer biomaterials like uh, pyrocarbon? uh, Does the, the American colleagues, do they have experience with the pyrocarbon? Is it any better yeah. than the... Was anyone on the ID, George, did you do that? The pyrocarbon? I don't know if anyone has any of that data. So, so I have um, all the data on pyrocarbon uh, where it's been submitted to the FDA. So it's actually, I can't disclose it, uh, but um, it's it's variable. Uh, there is still erosion that happens. And I think with the pyrocarbon, the unique aspect of it is, is you can't anneal pyrocarbon to metal. You have to have an interface. And so the interface can be polyethylene or some other substrate. And so what that does is that if you have standard anatomic heads that are 19 millimeters thick, and then you anneal another substance to it, you can make them 23, 24 millimeters. So you actually, if you're very used to doing a hemiarthroplasty, you end up overstuffing the joint if you're not aware of the extra thickness of the the, the head. Um, So it's interesting, um, the Australians have got very good data on it uh, from Brisbane. Um, and they seem to have very, they use the Integra type device. Uh, it's one group, it's I think Phil Duke and Mark Ross, uh, and they've got very favorable data. So I think the IDE data will, will, will probably be favorable. I think it will uh, be submitted uh, in Q1 of 2021, I suspect. Um, and so you'll have it available in the US sometime mid year. Thank you. Let's move on to the next case. Yes, please. Butch? Our next talk is by Butch. And uh, it, it really is a, is a pleasure to be here. Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet. It, it, uh, not you yet. Know, the, this, is a, this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful conference. You know, we're, you know, thanks Hold to Samir and to Anshu. Hold on, Sima. Not there? Share your oh. screen, uh, Sima, please. Uh, okay. Try. I'm going to do it for him. Got it. I just did it I'm doing it for you, Butch. Hold on. Got it. Can you guys Go. see it? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Well, you know, again, it's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Uh, I know almost everyone on this call personally, and I can share, you know, being both sides, being both Desi and also uh, the son of one of the founders <laughs> of the Indian, you know, Shoulder Society that, uh, you know, when my father and Dinesh Patel first came to India, a whole different world back in the 80s. And, uh, Volume is uh, less. We can't hear you, Butch. Can you hear me better now? Is that is that okay? Still, no? still a bit feeble voice. 
a little bit feeble. Is that better? Better now? Better voice? Um, it should be the same as before. Can you hear me yeah. okay? Yeah, okay. Much better? Yes. Uh, right. Let's try it again. I was just saying that, uh, you know, again, when, when my father and Dinesh Patel first introduced arthroscopy to India back in the 80s, you know, <coughs> it was amazing how, how much of a collaboration occurred between what they had here in the United States and what they took back to India, and, you know, fast forward now almost 40 years later, and here we are all together and in a virtual fashion without having to fly back and forth with a pandemic going on. And I, uh, you know, I, I'm heartfelt touched because I know my father's on this call as well. David Rajan is on this call and they've led uh, really the charge to, to join us together. So I wanted to talk a little bit about something that has, has been a bit of a conundrum for us here in, in Dallas, which is uh, the painful but functional reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. So as we know with the data on arthroplasty over the years, in 2020, the vast majority of arthroplasties in the westernized world are some configuration of an inverted arthroplasty. You know, we can all argue the debates of doing a, a polyethylene glenoid versus a, a convex metal glenoid, but the fact of the matter is the majority of surgeons are, are performing reverse arthroplasties. And as we perform more reverse arthroplasties, we'll have more revisions. But we'll also have these patients that are just painful for reasons that perhaps we never encountered with the classical anatomic hemiarthroplasty with a polyethylene glenoid. So this is an 80-year-old right-hand dominant man. He had failed two prior cuff repairs prior to his primary reverse arthroplasty. The implantation was done one year prior to his presentation to our institution. He had the usual comorbidities that occur in the United States, especially in Texas. He was hypertensive, he was diabetic, a thyroid issue, hyperlipidemia, but he had reasonable range of motion. He was able to actively elevate above shoulder level. 135 degrees is reasonable to perform the majority of functions of activities of daily living. He had external rotation uh, beyond 30 degrees. He could rotate to his hip pocket. He could perform everything that he wanted to do in life. He just had pain. He complained of pain, in his words, from the moment he had his operation all the way through the ensuing year. So these are his x-rays. As we can see, he has uh, a reverse arthroplasty. This is a, a short stem humeral component. The component was performed in an onlay configuration. We see the suture anchor in the greater tuberosity from the previous rotator cuff repair. The glenoid implant has an augmented base plate with a, a metallic augment and uh, what appears to be an eccentric glenosphere. So when we measure the angles and the, the French have taught us uh, several different ways to evaluate uh, what happens to the arm with the reverse arthroplasty. And we can debate whether or not we should use angles or measurements, but at least uh, these particular angles, the distalization shoulder angle, lateralization shoulder angles, have demonstrated retrospectively to collaborate or to correlate with successful results. Well, he falls within the parameters. You know, the distalization shoulder angle in Johannes Barth's study should be 40 to 65 degrees. Yeah, this is reasonably so. The lateralization shoulder angle should be 70 to 95 degrees or 75 to 95. It's okay looks pretty good, but this man has pain. Now, when we use some of the measurements that we use, we, we see a little bit of, uh, of concern. When we actually do scale bilateral humeral views, we see that the distance between, between the acromion and the greater tuberosity is almost six centimeters. You know, that's, uh, that's over two inches. And the distance between the acromion and the lateral edge of the greater tuberosity is almost 15 millimeters. So there is not only an arm lengthening, there's both a distalization and a lateralization in this patient. Of course, as with everything else, painful arthroplasty equals infection, right? Pain equals infection. Well, we did all of our labs, our aspirations, biopsies, everything is negative. On his CT scan, we saw no osteolysis, and this is a metal suppression CT scan on the right side. You know, it's a reasonably well-positioned implant as the company who would, you know, give a technique guide to this, would advocate the implant should be. Electromyographically, there was no acute abnormality. There was no cervical radiculopathy, no thoracic outlet changes, nothing in the brachial plexus, but this man had pain. 
So the etiologies for unresolved pain after a very functional reverse total shoulder arthroplasty with a totally normal workup. You know, uh, you know we, we teach our residents and fellows here in Dallas that, uh, you know, we never trust anything. We try to trust but verify. Is this indeed an undiagnosed infection? Is it potentially an implant allergy? You know, we do have a small subset of patients in the United States who have an allergy to, to nickel and consequently with the cobalt chrome spheres can have an, a problem. Is this still osteolysis and notching that we just don't see on the CT scan and it, perhaps it's a different view? Or is this some type of neuropathic pain? Because the problem or difference between this type of a semi-constrained implant and an anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty is effectively we're potentially changing the position of the arm and the length of the arm relative to the neurologic uh, structures. So if it is indeed neuropathic pain, assuming all workup is negative, is it cervical mediated? You know, did we do something at the time of surgery, perhaps uh, traction on the arm when we were performing the implant, the reduction, so on and so forth? Is this a brachial plexopathy from excessive tension? Is this a peripheral neuropathy? You know, Gilles Walsh uh, demonstrated in a retrospective study that they then again performed prospectively that 50% of patients who have some type of a semi-constrained reverse implant have electromyographic changes immediately after surgery. Whether those manifest as clinical symptoms, they're still present. So this case, again, had an augmented glenoid base plate, an eccentric glenoid sphere, an only humeral component, but perhaps this is really something that some patients cannot tolerate with regard to the distal position and the lateral position. So we elected to reduce the humeral lateralization and reduce the distalization. So we removed the augmented base plate. At the time of surgery, of course, we sent pathology, everything was negative, multiple sections, so on and so forth. We used a, a concentric lateralized glenosphere as opposed to an eccentric or you know, excessively lateralized glenosphere, and we attempted to inlay the humeral component meaning placing the humeral component further into the humerus. The whole goal is to restore the center of rotation and the position of the humeral shaft relative to the thorax more anatomically than it was done before. So these were the preoperative uh, angles. The distalization shoulder angle on the left side, as you can see, was 59.7 degrees. And there was a, a greater than 10% delta just by simply changing this. And we're talking about millimeters. You know, I had this discussion uh, a little bit earlier today with our residents and fellows when we were talking about uh, the reverse implants, and George said it very well. You know, you can kind of get in the ballpark with a reverse, and, you know, maybe it's, it's like playing baseball with a big aluminum bat. You can hit the ball, but to really dial it in, we're talking about millimeters. So just by this slight change, there was an 11.6% delta in the angles. With regard to the lateralization shoulder angle, 3% change, but as you can see, and we're all as orthopedic surgeons, we're very visual people. It just seems that the humerus is sitting in perhaps a slightly better position. And we're using the same type of humeral implant that was used before as far as angles and such. We're just placing the bone a bit differently. But with regard to the acromiohumeral distance and the greater tuberosity distance, this is a much bigger difference. And I think this really comes to the point of how we do these types of implants. You know, we're seeking to perform what we call an anatomic reverse shoulder arthroplasty, which means we're trying to put the center of rotation as close as possible. And I think, George, you and I had this discussion a couple of years ago when, uh, when we were talking about doing this type of an implant. And there really is, at least in, in my hands, a difference between whether we put this implant on the bone or in the bone and the position of the implant relative to the rest of the soft tissues, there's a sweet spot. So in summary, at least for me, the etiology for unresolved pain after functional reverses, if they're not infected and they don't have an implant allergy, we really need to think about a neuropathic pain. So I would encourage you to take a look at these patients who come back, who feel that they have perfect range of motion but continue to have pain. We're always taught to evaluate for infection, but perhaps we need to think about other options. So I, I think that's, a, that's really an important talk because all of the people on this talk, all of the, the speakers, whether in, in India or here, use different types of implants. So, uh, you know, I'll throw it back to Vani. Vani, you've talked about uh, the instance of acromial stress fractures, I believe, with uh, different types of implants and 
you know, do you have any experience with whether or not putting the implant, you know, uh, further distal, further lateral makes a difference in your patients? You know, I've had some discussions with Dr. Ainati about this specific thing, and I think it really does make a difference. I really think the points you brought up are real. I think we don't understand them well enough yet to understand based on a body habitus of a patient. I found gender is a big issue. So I, I personally use an onlay, and I've noticed very specific parameters, and our preoperative software is now using it. My big joke to my fellow is we have a lot of numbers that I don't know what to do with. So, I mean, I think we are starting to understand it. I just think getting more data out there on, you know, I, I think is really going to be the most important thing and how that specifically quantifies and relates to function. Because I think right now we don't have enough data on the relationship with some of these in complications or function. You know, George, George you were talking about uh, augmented reality and, uh, you know, Jean Shawi, maybe some of our Indian colleagues may not know him, but Jean has really helped bring to the forefront augmented reality and planning and so on and so forth. And he's an engineer, he is not an orthopedic surgeon. And Jean, we've had a long discussion about the need to, to understand not just the soft tissues of the rotator cuff in and around the shoulder, but the actual position of the arm relative to the thorax, because it makes a huge difference. You know, there's a nice paper in the literature now talking about the incidence of complications in patients with low BMIs with reverse arthroplasties, not high BMIs, because there seems to be much less of a tolerance. So George, do you have any experience or can guide us in, uh, at least with your, you know, your work with planning and, and uh, you know, virtual reality on, uh, on some parameters for these patients to, to avoid neuropathic pain? I, mean, um, I think it's such a challenging thing because it's so disease specific, right? We know like an E2, maybe worse than an E3, that they're high up there, and the E3s tend not to be as high. To bring E2 down is a little more challenging for me. Uh, bringing the Cs out laterally. Uh, so I think probably a lot of it has to do with the disease and what soft tissues are remaining. Um, and I think right now it's just multifactorial. I don't think I can dial it into one thing or another. Um, I think it is a bit of a black box. The one thing I, I would ask, uh, Sumant, is with your case, uh, uh, having done something similar, was it difficult to dislocate the f when you went back in? And then the problem I have is that it's loose now. It's kind of stretched out. So did you put a constrained poly on? Did you put a bigger sphere on? And did you try to lateralize a little bit more with the tray to build on more lateral offset? I was curious of what you did for your case. So uh, I'll answer all those questions with no. So no, it wasn't actually difficult to dislocate. No, I didn't use anything lateralized. I didn't use a constrained liner and it didn't change anything. And, you know, George, if you'd asked me that five years ago, I would have said yes, 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 and yes. And what we found is that actually these patients, you know, we talk about the stretch and the static stretch of the capsule and so on and so forth, that, that actually really, it, it's so specific on this particular construct on the humeral side to the glenoid side. And it's not so difficult to dislocate. And I have actually, over the last 500 implants, not used a single constrained implant. And Mark Frankel and I have had this discussion, and I, I think Mark is right about this because he rarely uses a constrained implant. His implant is at a different angulation, and he really seeks to, to bring the humerus lateral and, and vertical to the thorax. And we can debate and argue all those things, but, but it's an entire construct. You know, at, our, at the ASES meeting over the weekend, John Sperling demonstrated beautifully with one particular implant how he was going to get to, to a particular point. He used an augmented base plate, but he actually reamed superiorly. So he brought the base plate in and he reached the same point. So back to George again, you know, this is, these are really difficult cases. And I think as we start doing more and more reverse arthroplasties and teaching our surgeons who maybe do less than 20 or 30 a year, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to get some things wrong than it is to get everything right. So, you know, that's neither here nor there, and I don't mean to, to, to be evasive, but no, it, it was not as difficult. And I think that's because we're starting to understand a little bit better. But I, I, have, I have a question for Samir and, uh, and Anand 
as far as, as your implants, you know, we, again, we all use different types of reverse or inverted implants. Do you have any specific parameters, Samir, for how, how you judge your intraoperative tension? You know, the, uh, the Australians are talking about intraoperative, you know, tensiometers to use. We haven't had very good experience with that, but how do you judge either preoperatively, intraoperatively, or postoperatively what's right for you? I personally use the conjoint tendon initially and then the actually nerve two and just look at those two initially. And then as I'm getting close to when I'm trialing where I like to be, I'm again going back and checking the tension of those. And I also make sure that my arm position is in the same position too. And I sometimes tell the residents, if my arms flex my, you know, forward, my, my conjoint all of a sudden seems much looser. So I got to maintain the same position and check in that same position uh, when I do it. And on a, you know, uh, Mark, has talked about and, and written a paper on uh, the intraoperative range of motion being the best predictor of postoperative recovery of active function after inverted arthroplasty. And do you, if you find that you know you're doing a primary reverse and you implant and you reduce, but maybe it's a little bit tight and you you have to force the arm into full elevation, do you ever consider prior to putting your definitive implants in maybe dialing it back a little bit? as George said, maybe not using a, a thicker poly or do you, do you adjust it at all? And I think since 2004, I've gotten looser and looser and looser. And I, I don't think, I think putting them in tight now leads to this neuropathic pain that you're talking about. And I totally agree with you and Mark that we've got to try to make more and more anatomic reverses, um, which means maybe going more lateral, less distalization and, um, and I've tried to do more and more of that. So it's, it's not, I'm never really forcing it in. It's really gentle now. And if you balance it right, and like you said, if it's anatomic, if it's more lateral and vertical in that space, I don't think, and instability, like you said now, is really never, an, is rarely an issue in a primary anymore. So there are, a lot of, you know, there are a lot of young surgeons on the, on the call. And, you know, we, as Ashish knows from, you know, 15 years ago in Raghu, when we did these, we put these in as tight as possible because we were worried about instability, but Anand yeah. is exactly it's, right. It, it's so much more anatomic now. So Butch, I, I want to uh, just a quick question, there. Butch. When you put them in tight 15 years ago, what was your incidence of acromial insufficiency fractures? So actually it's very interesting, right? Because uh, we did this with a 155 degree implant. I would routinely use a, a nine millimeter poly and I put it in as tight as possible. And the incidence of fractures was 6%. So I put this in looser now. I use a different implant, and our instance of acromial fractures is less. It's between uh, maybe 1 to 1.5%, but I think that our, our instance of acromial pain, if I did the implant the way it's designed, and fracture would probably be very close because it's a different type of implant. So there are a lot of young surgeons on the call, and Butch, I just want to uh, ask you a question and make a comment. My comment is, most often when they have a painful shoulder, I don't want people to lose sight of the fact it is infection, okay? It, it, it is, you know, it, it is cervical spondylosis. Those are usually the things that are coming. And you have to think of that one, one and two always. My question, and so I don't want the young surgeons on to think that because it's an altered biomechanic mm -hmm. is, the, is a primary reason. You got to think that first of all, have I missed those things? Yes. And along those lines, I mean, you, you are you saying, because if, if I take what you're saying next to the next level, there are only a finite number of people, master surgeons, that are going to be able to get that biomechanics just right to get that sweet spot, what you're saying. So are you then saying that you're going to, you're put, like we all know more is better or of doing more operation. Are you saying basically then if you're not doing 30 to 40 reverses a year, you shouldn't be doing them? Because <laughs> I cannot imagine someone who's doing 20, 20 or less to be able to appreciate what you're saying. So, you know, I'm putting myself back out in space now um, because, uh, you know, really, Ranjan, th that's absolutely not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to say that, you know, we, we thought we were doing everything right when we started doing this implant in 2004. And, uh, you know, I can say this because we implanted okay. the very first one, you know, in actually 2003 that was FDA approved. And we thought we were doing the right thing. We did it the French way. Then 10 years later, we realized we didn't really know what we were doing. And now here we are almost 20 years later, and we're trying to relearn this. So for the young surgeons on the call, Runjan's exactly right. Infection, 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 infection. 
But at some point, there are going to be some patients that you're going to find that there is nothing else there other than the fact that they're painful. And either you're going to leave them with pain, tell them to go away and go to California, or you're going to take the implants out and leave them with a resection arthroplasty, or you're going to try to revise them. And so my only point about this case is just to introduce a concept that when you get past all of the other real reasons for these things being painful, just consider the fact that maybe the construct might not have been exactly right. So Butch, can I ask you to give us some sort of finite guidelines, right? Uh, Pat Denard and Brad Parsons wrote a, an element analysis that maybe just five millimeters. So for you with a onlay and a humeral or potential glenar lateralization system, how much distalization, how much lateralization, where is your target range as best as we know 2020. So we, so, so everyone on the audience can walk away with, okay, here's a target. A chromium to greater tuberosity distance, 2.5 centimeters. A chromium to the lateral position of the greater tuberosity, no more than 10 millimeters. And we found that if we can get close to those parameters, it's really, really very close to the center of rotation of the humerus. Now, I mean, those are x-rays. They're not fluoroscopically controlled. That's me throwing out opinion here. But we really, if you exceed that acromion to greater tuberosity distance by more than three to 3.5 centimeters, you gotta be a little bit careful. And, and I understand that we're talking about all kinds of different implants. And so all I'm saying is just, to, just be careful because it is a combined construct. It's not just what happens on the humeral side. It's not just what happens on the glenoid side. So Sumant, let me ask you a bucket of question. Best, best case, are you gonna do a 60 year old with OA? Cuff intact, reverse or total? Reverse. 50 year old, cuff intact. You're gonna do the arthroplasty. Reverse. reverse or total? Reverse. 40 year, 40 year old. Hemi. Okay. Yeah, Can I just so make what? one small point? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, just one more question uh, on that. Then as long, as long as the arthrosis is concentric. If they're eccentric in any way, I'm gonna do a semi-constrained reverse. Can I just make one small point for the younger folk too, is that a lot of the newer systems are taking technology and concepts from every different company and combining them. Yes. And so as we see some of these newer companies are offering like so many options that if you don't really have a game plan, you can, you can really lengthen and lateralize quite a lot without really realizing it. So I just think it's really important to understand like some of the newer companies are taking kind of consistent um, evidence that's come up from some of the other arthroplasty companies and combining all the concepts into one arthroplasty. And I think you have to really be conscientious when you're doing a reverse to understand what works and what combination works, not only in your hands, but for patients and what the science shows. And also to piggyback on what Vani just said, in India, as we know, and Ram, you can, you can speak to this, Yes. You don't have so many implant options, and you have a population yes. that's, that's much smaller, both in stature and in size yes. than we have. You know, my average patient is, uh, you know, six foot two <clears throat> inches tall, 240 pounds, and that's a giant in India. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we have only, uh, when we started, we have only one company, but we have now five companies. A couple of them, uh, both Zimmer and Evolutis, have got a smaller size prosthesis uh, designed for Indian use. Uh, but I think I take, uh, all points uh, highlighted by Vani as well as Suman, very important because in the reverse shoulder arthroplasty case scenario, for us to see the difference, it takes 10 years to see the difference between any parameters. But then there is a combination of parameters involved uh, uh, in one uh, surgery to achieve. So I think we had to take everything into account, especially understand the biomechanics, do not do things grossly wrong. At the same time, uh, uh, appreciate the difference between the companies because they want to add uh, extra to their portfolio. So they increase the option. Sometimes leaves the young surgeon so confused to choose out of nine glenosphere what to choose. And there's more tendency to go wrong rather than right. Thank you. Sumant, for these uh, neuropathic patients, um, there's a question in the chat of like, when do you see this pain? And I had a follow-up question of where do you see this pain, especially on your patient, where was the pain? You know, so the, that's, that's the interesting part because this is the conundrum. And we've gone back to look at this group of patients in, in, our, in our series of, of reverse arthroplasties, and it's diffuse. You know, you, you can't localize it with a diagnostic injection. They complain of pain 
you know, when they're sleeping in their neck, pain down their arm, pain in the hand. And as we all know with patients, they say, my arm hurts. Well, what does your arm hurt? Well, it hurts here. Does it hurt here or here? You know, it's all the way down the arm. And it's this, it's unspecified pain. That's the best way I can say it. Not always with activity, not always with sleep. Sometimes they'll have 12 hours with no pain. So generally these people have pain after surgery that never resolves. You know, we all are very happy treating, you know, I'll use an inflammatory arthritic. Somebody who has rheumatoid arthritis, they don't care if you do a hemi, a total or a reverse. You take away their, their synovitis in their joint, they think you're, you're a genius. They're pain-free. These people never, ever have a pain-free moment. And, and I think that's really the thing to keep in mind. And these aren't chronic pain patients who came to you who have been on narcotics prior to. These are fairly normal people. Yeah. Samir, you're up. All In right. the interest of time, let's move on. Yes. Samir, it's yours. All right. Well, thank you, guys. We're going to talk, uh, switch gears now from uh, a wonderful discussion on uh, um, uh, replacements to instability here. So I'll quickly go over uh, our virtual meeting. I know uh, Vani explained what the uh, meeting was like in this, this, uh, this format. Uh, so I'll just go over the abstracts here. There's the uh, first one was um, by the Rothman Group, the early postoperative complications after a ladder J over a 10 year experience. So they were looking at just complications in the first 90 days. And they found that uh, you know, 4.8% of graft failure, nerve injury was 3%, and the reoperation rate was about 4.2%. They also found that half these nerve injuries led to prolonged symptoms. Uh, they also found that uh, divergent screws and, or single screw fixation were predictors of failure. Uh, and this was presented by Serena. Uh, interestingly, over uh, an institution like Rothman, for 10 years to have 185 um, ladder Js, I, I thought was Interestingly, just a, a little bit lower than I would have thought for them. And I'm curious to see what the uh, Indian experience has been in terms of uh, numbers. Um, the next study was done by a Matt Preventure, who had a couple of papers in this uh, uh, meeting. He talked about the limited predictive value of the instability severity score that Pascal Below um, uh, did, talked about uh, and, and published a few years back. He looked at 217 consecutive patients with recurrent anterior shoulder instability, and they looked for risk factors for failure. Uh, they looked for on and off track lesions, the ISS score, the WOSI, the ASCS, and the SANE scores. And they had in their group of 217 patients, 25% had recurrent dislocation and 192 did not. And the mean ISS score uh, was 3.9 in the recurrence group and 3.4 in the non-recurrent group. Uh, so really did, did not see any significant uh, difference there. Uh, glenoid bone loss, uh, instability that was greater than three months, uh, Hill sacs lesion volume were more predictive in their, in their study of, um, of recurrent failure and uh, not the ISS scores. They really felt that, uh, as many people have also said, including Pascal, that the ISS may not be as useful as we uh, initially thought it might be. The other study um, that Matt did was uh, risk factors for recurrent anterior glenohumeral instability and clinical failure following primary ladder J procedure. And he had 344 patients in this survey with all greater than five-year follow-up. Interestingly, they found coracoid osteolysis found in over 50% in both in each group, both in the recurrence group and the non-recurrence group. However, there was uh, no, no difference in recurrence instability with the osteolysis. They had an overall 5% recurrence rate with instability. And what they called uh, clinical failure was about 8%. This included patients who had just pain, stiffness, poor function overall, or something that they just deemed clinical failure. They called it 8%. It's with an overall failure rate of about 13%. So definitely uh, not um, you know, uh, insignificant. Uh, they found that atraumatic mechanisms, bilateral instability, a female gender uh, were the highest risk, uh, things for risk for failure. The next study was uh, progression to glenohumeral arthritis after arthroscopic anterior stabilization in the young and high demand population. This was done by Jonathan Dickens. It was mainly a military population of US military recruits. And they had 287 patients with a minimum four year follow-up. So they were able to follow these patients for several years as they stayed through the military. Uh, detailed studies, um, but they found no uh, difference in the ability to calculate the bone loss using both a standard dose as well as two lower dose protocols, one which had eight times lower dose and the other one 13 times lower dose radiation compared to the standard CT scan. Final, another one was uh, characterization of the hill sacs lesion based on uh, location, orientation, and volume. This is a three-dimensional modeling study 
uh, again by Matt Preventure. And he used this 3D modeling software to assess the Hillsax lesion in a little bit more detail. And they found the lesion had varying angles and medialization that were better identified than on a 2D CT scan. Uh, and they found the medial lesions were not larger, they were just more medial um, in that study. Uh, another study looked at the CT assessment of coracoid morphology uh, for patient-specific pre-op planning for ladder Js. Uh, They're looking at the measurements of the coracoid and seeing if on CT they can assess whether uh, one way or another would be better. They looked at seeing if there's a congruent arc measurement or the classic ladder J pattern and which one might be able to restore more of the AP diameter. Uh, and they found that the cam uh, way was more likely to restore uh, the AP diameter than the classic ladder J but they also found that coracoid thickness was potentially an issue with the thickness being less than 10 millimeters in most females, which could predispose to higher risk of fracture. Uh, another study was the uh, SANE score for instability as an alternative to the ROSE score. Uh, this is a single assessment numeric evaluation. Uh, basically they asked one question and was, what is the overall percent value of your shoulder if a completely stable shoulder represents 100%? And they found that that score that the patients could give rel relatively quickly had a good correlation with the row, row score and is simpler to ask. This was also published just recently in GSES, so this audience may have already seen this paper. Uh, final study, I think, was the shoulder pacemaker treatment concept for posterior positional functional instability. This is a two-year prospective clinical trial. And what they did, they put these little electrode stimulators on the back of the shoulder at the, um, uh, uh, the hyperactive muscles of the scapula and the rotator cuff external rotators for six weeks to try to get them to stimulate when there's a potential for this uh, instability. And they found that this decreased the, the percentage of this and it was effective in athletes thin patients and patients without any structural defects. And they have a website as this was a little bit more of a, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, 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 industry related uh, thing here where they were peddling an actual uh, object here. So that was basically the papers that were presented uh, at the meeting. Now I have a couple of questions to my panelists, which are Karthik and Paul. I want you know each of you to share with the uh, other side your breakdown in your practice of uh, arthroscopic versus open instability procedures. And for your open procedure, are you doing mainly uh, open bank cards, ladder J's, or other procedures? And then this is the one biggest challenge you face when you are treating instability uh, in your population. If I could uh, uh, have Paul and uh, Karthik uh, weigh in on that. Maybe start with you, Karthik. Uh, percentage of open procedures have gone up uh, over the years. Now uh, it's roughly about 30%, 30 to 35% uh, open procedures. By open, I mean an open latage. Uh, we don't do any open bank art. So uh, there are a lot of primary latages being done nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. So the, um, that's the thing. So um, no other procedure other than a bank, arthroscopic bank cut or an arthroscopic bank cut with rumplissage or the latage. So we've got three surgeries and uh, we got about 30 to sometimes, uh, yeah. So over the years, the amount of uh, primary latage has gone up. And um, yeah, I think the challenge here is, to, uh, um, I, I think I'm just going to cover that in my talk. When I come there for the third okay. question, I'm just going to cover Sounds it, yeah. Good. Okay, Paul, you want to weigh in on our side? So uh, actually, I, I think Karthik and I are similar in the in the mix. Maybe, it's, maybe I'm 75, 25, I, I can't tell you for sure. I think open procedures, well, there's there, there's a couple of different things that I, I will throw into the mix. And uh, there, to me, there is a world between the scope and the ladder J. And uh, maybe maybe I'll cover that a little bit more in my talk. And the, and the biggest challenge that I face is honestly, it, it's the young, unstable, sort of slightly lax patient, right? Because I'm just wondering when they're 14 or 15 and they get to my, my OT, when I'm going to be back again the next time. And, and I'm fearful of that. But but on that, Karthik, please, uh, you show us, and then we'll come back. Yeah. yeah. On that note, I'll end my screen share here, and uh, and I'll let Karthik uh, take over here. Okay. I'm going to share my screen. I'm just going to present a couple of cases of uh, bipolar bone loss because uh, that's the job I'm going to do. So bone loss, as we know, has been given a lot of importance now, um, over the recent years, and there have been several attempts to define the critical bone loss for um, bone augmentation procedures, and uh, there have been several values uh, given. Um, now, 
tracking is the latest evolution in our understanding of instability but uh, what we need to understand is bone loss alone does not decide failure you know, uh, there are several other factors including the quality of labrum intraoperative quality of labrum the capsular hyperlaxity as uh, rightly pointed out by uh, paul and samir and age um exactly too young at first dislocation that's again a big risk factor and the professional demand if he is an elite athlete or a manual laborer the demands are different compared to a, a sedentary office going worker so this is my first case he's a 29 year old professional cameraman cinematographer um he makes uh, bollywood films and he also plays basketball he's 29 and he's had over 20 episodes of dislocation of his right shoulder in the past 4 years um he's quite apprehensive he's not hyperlax and uh, he carries uh, heavy equipment in his shoulder and he has to sometimes uh, run with a heavy camera on his shoulder and he has to hold it in abduction x rotation here, here all the time and he has not been working because of his severe apprehension so that's the uh, clinical story here he's 29 as a professional cameraman and uh, he's got several episodes of dislocation that's the mri picture he's got a bony bank art lesion um and a 3d ct scan has been done i'm sorry the pictures are not here and the 3d ct shows 15% glenoid bone loss and there is an off track hill sac lesion so you can see that there is a huge uh, um hill sac and also um so i would just like to ask the panelists here these are the options basically we got three option at least for me these are the three options and uh, how would one go about deciding the surgery is it a bank cut a bank cut rompissage or a latage uh, can i ask samir yeah i think in this case i would do a latage um just because of the bone loss the bipolar nature of it my concern is with the bank cut and the rompissage i think i could get them tight enough but i worry about the recurrence because of the bone loss on the glenoid there yeah how about uh, suman so i would also do a, a latter j in this case paul i'm going to fall in line with everybody else and, and do latter j but you're right i i will have considered a, a bankart plus uh but but likely gone to the bone here because of the size of the hill sacks okay how about ram dr ram is, is a bony bankart right yeah Uh, i would uh, have an options open basically uh, just do a arthroscopy uh, release and try to repair the bankot bony bankot with replisage and if i'm not satisfactory with that I convert to open platage so you will go in uh, with the scope option and then design yes, yes yes okay and um, uh, to see how about dr ashish yes um, cutting i would i would scope him but uh, uh i usually do my bank cards in lateral and my latages in b chair so i would do this in the b chair scope evaluate uh, look for the engaging uh, measure the hill sac intraop and if it looks doable do a bank card remplissage but likely that i would proceed with a arthro latage for this patient and that's where the planning comes in where i'll keep this patient in the b chair when i go in so you would uh, you would rely on your pre operative uh... measurements you know, so always do an interoperative uh, assessment as well yeah we tend to look at things in black and white there are these gray zone areas where you're not dead sure whether you would want to do a bank out or a latage and in such cases i keep a plan open counsel them and put them in a beach chair and go in and take a look when you have a 20% bone loss i think it's a no brainer when you have a 4% bone loss then again it's a no brainer i would do a bank out remplissage in those cases anyway but when you have this situation where you, you might want to salvage the bony bank cut and the hill sac is not too bad then i will sit on the fence do a scope and take a decision in trop since i do both of them in the beach i don't think it's a big deal for me okay anyone has a different view dr murthy um just not to see the others um, i agree with the you know i think i i personally would get a i like to get a 3d cat scan with humor subtracted to uh and allowed us me to measure it a little more but with the combination of that bone loss and the hill sac I would do a ladder j and possibly even a a, a rump massage also okay definite ladder j for me and uh probably rump massage with it and show you guys can can someone explain to me um when you need to do both a ladder j and a rump massage is there something I'm just getting there I'm just getting there I got a slide on that 
Sorry. <laughs> Probably just Latage for me. I'd maybe add a Remplissage if he was hyper lax, but you, it's really rare. So probably just a Latage if he's a young male. Bait and signs too only. So, yeah. I agree. I would probably do the same thing as Anjou. Excellent. So there is a lot of French influence on the Americans now. So I'm just. Uh, this is. In case, um, the, software, the software professional recreational badminton player. He's never had a proper dislocation. He always uh, feels that his shoulder locks when he smashes his uh, um, cork. So he has had an injection in physio with no avail. The previous doctor actually has um, probably thought it's an impingement or something. And, and that's how he came to us. And then we got an MRI and he was apprehensive. And uh, that's the 3D CT there. You could see uh, bone loss and that's the hill sac. And uh, my radiologist measured it and he says it's an off-track hill sac lesion. And his... Uh, Obviously, he's got about 15% bone loss here. He's a software professional. He just sits on the chair most of the time. The recreational badminton player, mind you, these badminton players in India can be very aggressive sometimes. They play a couple of hours every day. And uh, so, and uh, that's the situation there. I think the options again are the same. Um, so, would, uh, would anyone choose a different option? Would anyone do a scope? Um, and uh, fix this uh, bank art lesion. Um, so these questions quickly. I think bank art is a successful surgery, but then when, when it comes to bone loss, it's found to do this operation. And the arthropathy percentage in long term is almost similar to arthroscopic bank art. But then we can't do this surgery for everyone. There are several contraindications, especially in a hyperlax patient. And this paper uh, by Matt Provencher just pointed out recent um, in the last talk, published uh, is just hot of the press and you can see that in a patient who has a traumatic mechanism of uh, dislocation and the bilateral instability female gender has greater risk of recurrence of clinical failure with um, um, latage surgery so in ad advising latage you need to consider this as well so this is something new which has come up uh, in our understanding of um, shoulder instability the cavity of the glenoid which we need to take in mind it's not only the bone loss but also the effect of concavity of the glenoid on um, um, the stability. So my uh, um, my way to make the decision here is actually um, uh, I give the options to the patient and uh, discuss the options and uh, um, we also say this is the percentage of failure and the success you can expect from each surgery and the decision making actually goes like this and if it's an off-track hill sac lesion if the patient has capsular hyperlaxity like high baiten and the drive through mm -hmm. poor quality labrum intraoperatively irrespective of uh, irrespective of whether the hill sac is off track or on track, if the if it is an Alps or a very poor quality labrum, and if the demand is uh, sedentary, he's a recreational athlete. Then uh, I uh, think about arthroscopy here. I do a bank art with rumpus surge in these cases. Now, if the patient is a manual worker, contact athlete, elite overhead athlete, and uh, the glenoid bone loss is severe, or if it is a, even a subcritical bone loss with off track hill sac, then I don't shy away offering a latage. And I've seen most of my patients very very happy after this procedure. Uh, not, uh, not a lot of um, post-operative restrictions on them. Getting back to the field is uh, easier. Getting back to their work is quicker. And uh, it's a very economical surgery. Involves only a um, couple of metal screws. And it's very useful in the Indian scenario. So, um, Latage plus Rumplissage. Uh, in my hands, I've got uh, two patients who have actually had a neglected anterior dislocation for the shoulder with significant uh, bone loss on the uh, glenoid side and also on the humeral side. And these are patients whom I've done a um, Latage with Rampusage. These are the only patients, not, not a regular patient. These are all neglected cases, four months, six months, uh, neglected anti dislocation. And they have done well, um, but I wouldn't do this routinely. Because, and when you do a Latage, actually, it actually covers the uh, humeral bone loss part as well because you actually add a lot of extra bone. So the lesion actually becomes uh, on track. So you don't need to really worry about doing a Rampusage in these cases. And uh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Nice. Karthik, I, yeah. uh, very nice. You've covered everything very well, but I have strong reservations on the Matt Provencher paper where I agree with the premise, but I miss the conclusions because uh, I accept that there is ligament laxity and bilateral cases. They are largely likely to be MDIs. But I mean, why throw in gender discrimination there? If a female has a 20% bone loss, what are you going to resort to? Are you not going to do a latage? Because oh, um, 
They Overall, just, if you look at the percentage of female patients in dislocation, they are absolutely minuscule. Very But small. If, yeah. So if you weed out the ones who are ligament laxity and no bone loss, then if a bone loss exists in a female patient, you have to offer a latari. I don't see any other option there. Yeah. No, it's just that uh, the paper actually discusses that in detail about uh, uh, the paucity of data on female patients, and uh, so and they also say that you know. in a bone loss situation obviously there's no surgery to offer but uh, it's something to keep in mind that uh, there is a slightly higher incidence of clinical failure in uh, their female but obviously we know that we all operated on females and uh, with yeah. latarge and they got good yeah. results are you guys seeing my slides yes yeah yeah, yeah. just please great all right well i thought that was fantastic um i i'm going to have a, an additional case of of recurrent shoulder instability Um so here we have an a, a 17-year-old high school male who's had episodes of instability who was treated non-operatively initially there's no special tricks or surprises yet uh there that they'll, they'll maybe come later um and he undergoes an arthroscopic operation and after surgery I said listen it was really bad I was able to repair it it's very fortunate that I do so many I I hurt my shoulder my own shoulder I hurt it patting myself on the back by such a lovely repair. And I said you're going to do fine. He goes back to lifting weights. He has a little bit of a slow recovery. He goes back to lifting weights and does fine at the day and he's uh he goes off to university and in university um uh, he's an engineering student. He's an engineering student, but he likes to exercise and play sports. He gets in a scuffle with another engineering roommate over some mathematical formula and um this is what happens. he redislocates and he redislocates approximately uh 16 18 months after his index surgery so after i told him how good i was uh he redislocates and i said look well you know what do i do so i asked myself the questions this is a recurrent trauma how soon after the surgery is this my failure is this 5 7 or 10 years his failure is he a young man how many dislocations did he have before what did i miss Did I miss the anterior glenoid? Did I miss the hill sac? Did I miss the Hegel? Did I miss the capsular laxity? What error did I make? Did I place the anchors medially? Did I place them too high? Did I only use two anchors because I was I ran out of anchors that day? And I don't think I have any misses. So repeat X-rays. I don't see anything exciting. Now we go to a repeat MRI scan, and on the MRI scan, uh, we we can see that he he's got a recurrent, pretty large. Uh, pretty large bank card tear and it seems like there's a substantial amount of tissue there. So, you know, by virtue of of, of the American surgeons sort of really following a lot with a lot of what the Europeans have taught us, we all get CAT scans. And everyone gets a CAT scan and I think every recurrent dislocator or anyone who's suspicious on on primary dislocation meaning falling out of out of socket in sleep or something like that gets a recurrent. So, on his CAT scan Does he have bone loss? Does he have a bony bank cart? Is this a postage stamp fracture or did the bony bony bank cart never really get incorporated? So, uh, let, let's Karthik, you are my sorry co-moderator and Samir, you, you when you look at this top left CT scan, uh, is that a postage stamp or is that actually outside the postage stamp? And now how is this going to affect you? Yeah, it to me it looks old because the margins do look a little rounded there and you can see that one little cyst there that's still kind of in so it does appear that that anchor at the 4th 3 position still is this is outside that. So I wonder if this is, you know, uh, an old bony bank card. So I missed it or I didn't catch it. Um <laughs> Karthik, what do you have for me? I just I just missed I just missed it. it uh, this is the post operative uh, the, this is the CT just after the redislocation right uh, Most unfortunately you've you pointed out that yes he's redislocated yes No 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 what I mean is <laughs> <laughs> what I mean is this this is the after the redislocation so he has broken uh, just at the um, bone screw interface is it the So well, that's what I'm asking right I'm looking at this and I my my I first read is he's broken in appropriate surgery I agree with Kartik um, uh, Paul, so, uh, what was the interval between your index surgery yes. and the and this CT scan? Eighteen months. So, if you had missed the um, bony fragment, then it usually shrinks in size because it devascularizes. And uh, in a single row repair, 
sometimes i'm not saying in this case sometimes what happens is you flip the uh, bony fragment towards the joint and it opens out at the medial side and then that might reduce yeah. your chances of uh, incorporation and it's just advocating a case for a double row uh, bony mm-hmm. bank heart repair on such cases i i, I agree so now now guys it's uncertain is this a new fracture is it's uncertain is this a, a missed bony bank heart what, what am I going to do? Am I going to rescope him? You know, the the, re, the rate of re failure after rescope is somewhere between eighteen and forty three percent, depending upon who you read. Do I do a scope plus? This is the Zrompasage at Karthik. Will I do an open repair? And it seems to be non existent in, in Asia right now. Um, Doctor Nabizer uh, had had high success twenty two to twenty three. Cho reported eleven and a half percent failure. Or do I do a ladder J? LMO reported 0%, honestly, and I think that I was happy to see a 5% re-failure re, you know, failure rate. Or do I do another bony procedure? So uh, let's, go to, let's go to Anshu, let's go to Ram. Guys, what are you doing for this, this 18-year-old male, not a collision athlete, previous surgery, some bone loss? I would, I would prefer letter J. So, has he just come out once, Paul? She's a, a previous operated, and there is a bony fragment, uh, previous anchors also there. So, revision, orthoscopic fixation. Sorry, am I? He's only come out once after. Yeah, I know I, I've thrown up, I've gotten, I mean, look, where I live, once you come out after the surgery, I own you. There's CAT scans, there's MRIs, there's 11 opinions. Uh, uh, my preference would be to do a letter J. Ladder J. Anyone else? D- dissenters from Ladder J. No. Is he? Um, does he have? Uh, is he a hyperlax individual? Is he has? Does he have? That's a good question. You know, uh, I'll give you some more data. Here's his examination under anesthesia. Thank you for the tea. So this is to me a grade two instability. You can see he's relatively muscular, and I sort of I contrast that with with the grade three. And go live on. Yep. There's my grade three below. Comes out, stays out, comes out. So that's not him. He is not hyperlax and he is muscular. Right here, out in. All right. So ladder J's around the house. That's it. Is there is there any operation other than a scope and a ladder J? And this, I don't want any of the Americans to jump in. This is for for you know everyone in Asia. Is it's there done. anything? You're asking about an open let, open bank art here. I, I I guess yeah. I think it's a good operation if you. I think if you're if you're used to doing it, I think it's a good operation to offer this patient. Doesn't burn any bridges. You actually uh, are doing an anatomical operation, and uh, it's definitely more stable. Uh, at, at least according to literature. See, open back cord is a good operation, but here you have a previously operated patient with a refracture, dislocation, body fragment, previous episode, previous tracks of uh, your anchors. You need to put fresh anchors, so you're asking for too much with the open uh, bank cord procedure, if you are talking the same. The near capsular shift to open bank cord is a good operation as a primary. It's a primary operation. So that's what I, think I would do a letter, Jay. I'm not used to Paul. Can I pick your brains here? Please. Uh, I don't think there's a right and wrong on doing a bank card versus Nataji. Whatever works in your hand, uh, these cases, uh, it, there's a good possibility that a bank card will work in this case. And somebody wants a one off operation and no more. No Nataji more. is risk free. But uh, what I'm trying to ask you is what is it that you are going to achieve on an open bank card that you cannot do on an arthroscopic bank card? Forget this case, on a, on a so, broader spectrum. I think that's a wonderful question, and it seems to be truly debated, and, and the answer is not clear. So one person may argue, or one position is that I can do a lateral base capsule shift if appropriate, and I could probably get a little bit more of a, a scar reaction. And if you the, the, the literature really is divided, you can find the reports to support what you want. So Romeo and the group in, in Chicago did a comparison. They did a meta-analysis, which... By the way, I think many meta-analysis should be thrown out with the, the mm. day that they're written. But they did a meta-analysis saying that there's no difference between open and arthroscopic repairs, right? And I, it comes down to, and I'm going to flip it back to you, what is the true rate 
of recurrent instability after an arthroscopic operation in a collision athlete. Do we really believe it's between four and 6% or is it probably somewhat higher? And, and that's, I, I think it is. So I, I think that an open operation actually can, can convey a greater level of stability than can an isolated arthroscopic operation. Can I comment on that? Paul? Can I, can I, one sec, can I rephrase uh, Paul here? Uh, so let's accept that it's the scarification that is the uh, beneficial part of an open bank card, which means that we are probably aiming to restrict your, the external rotation, isn't that? Yes. So that is what works in favor of an open bank card versus an arthroscopic bank card. So before I answer, Anand, go ahead, because I, I can, I can oh. feel your right. experience. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think we're, we're a little bit of apples and oranges. I mean, I think the true uh, Columbia near bank cart is a medially based capsular repair, we, especially in chronic instability. We're not even concerned about repairing the labrum like we do in an arthroscopic repair. So you're plastering with mattress sutures, the medial capsule, and then you're doing a laterally based shift. And so I think the only downside with that operation is, is the subscap you have to deal with and repair and be really yes. careful on the, yeah. be really careful on your rehab. And I'll tell you, I can just tell you from my experience and Dr. Navizer's experience, I don't worry about an open bank card capsular shift in a contact athlete, but I do with a straightforward arthroscopic bank card and a wrestler and a football player across. Um, and I don't think, and, and while everyone on this panel may be an expert at doing ladder J, these patients and uh, you know, there was a question from Abik about Yap Willem's uh, discussion about arthropathy. In the Hovelia study, even with a perfect letter J, you know, the instance of arthropathy at 25 years was 40%. And you, it's just, you have to be careful because, again, we're talking about young people. And I think instability, and Paul, you've done a great job with this. Instability is so individualized. You really need, you, you have to dial it in. There's not one hammer for every nail. I hear people say, well, bone loss equals letter J or bone loss equals this. No, there, there's, there are so many parameters, male, female, young, old, Hill Sachs, glenoid, all of those things. So bravo to uh, biomechanical data that we're about to publish of distal tibia versus ladder J. So ladder J is powerful. It can be almost too powerful because it will load the posterior glenoid, especially in some in patient has 20, 30% bone loss. It, it's very constraining. It's almost too constraining. So in those cases, I'll go to distal tibia or really at crest or something like that. So, All right. So, uh, Anshu Singh, what did I do? Uh, you did an open bank card on this. Open Capsular bank card. Shift. Capsular that shift. That doesn't sorry. exist. That wasn't on the lexicon of what we described. The open capsular shift. Sorry. All right. I'm going to give you one more chance to be correct. Hold on. Here is his arthroscopy video, right? And here he is. You're looking in. There's just this sort of lousy kind of crappy tissue. Our colleagues in Asia are like, oh, gosh, that's what it always looks like. We have 12, 15 dislocations. Andrew, mm -hmm. one more time. Looking at that imagery, what did I do? I would have done a lot of that. I think you did, you did open something or the other. Open capsular shift, I think. Sticking your guns on this one, huh? Ranjan, anything? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a ladder J on this one. Because that's I think you did a reverse arthroplasty operations. Anyway, here's what I did. You were right, Dr. Sting. You're very smart. I released along the, the lateral side. I found it. And here, I don't know if you can see my, my here, here it was initially. I got a, four anchors around, a double loaded. I used a combination of mattress and simples, and I lift it up and smash that that glenoid uh rather that labrum all the way against the glenoid um so i guess the question i leave everyone with and what we think about is is it either arthroscopic or ladder j and should open repair be laid to rest or not this boy did wonderful regains his full external range of motion um and actually said to me that the open operation was an easier recovery than was the arthroscopic you know, there's one other element. Karthik said that he, in overhead athletes that you would do a ladder J. That's not always been my experience. I feel like, like what um, Anand said, that sometimes it does constrain them too much in Aver positioning and, and they lose some of their explosiveness overhead. What do you guys do for those people? Well, it's interesting. I don't know if I followed what Samir and Karthik were saying about, redo, about repairing the capsule at the same time, but in the overhead athletes in whom I've done a ladder J, 
I've done nothing to the bank cart and specifically no capsule repair. So I just wanted to revisit it. I didn't know if I followed that entirely. Yeah, I might have missed it. I just reattach the capsule to the AC, joint, AC ligament stump and that's all I do. I don't actually use any anchors to do a proper bank cart there. Yeah, that's and, all uh, when, we offer, so, when we offer the surgeries and discuss with the patient, the patient obviously wants, especially the athletes, they want one surgery which is foolproof. And um, I think uh, um, at least we are swayed by current literature to offer them Latage. And uh, as pointed out by Sumanth and uh, others, I think it has to be technically perfect if you are offering such an operation to an athlete. That's the only thing. But otherwise, I have not found any problem in overweight athletes uh, with uh, Latage. Yeah, Paul, uh, that was a point I was making that uh, whenever I do an open Latage, I always do a Bankart capsule shift because uh, you could have a situation where they are stable, but uh, sorry, where they are not dislocating but unstable uh, because when the arm goes into the 170, 180 degrees position in an overhead athlete, then uh, they can have instability in a Latage, especially when the graft is a little higher. So my soft tissue repair will complement the latarje and also make the graft extra articular for whatever it's worth. And and does that for you, I, I'm, you know, I'm fearful, but I, again, I've learned a lot and there's some big changes today, biceps, hemis, open bank hearts. Does that limit, I'm worried about when I do any extra work after latarje that I'm going to limit my external rotation. So, uh, Paul, <laughs> I was trained by Joe DeBeer on his uh, congruent art latarje and I followed his technique and I've uh, imbibed most of that. Uh, as I'm, I'm speaking on all your behalf, our latages are not stiff. They have a much better range than the bank arts because we do a lot more inferior to superior shift and uh, tightening on the front side. The bank arts tend to be losing about 8 to 10 degrees of their external rotation. In an overhead athlete, in a latage, I don't want them to be loose. In the wrestlers and the uh, contact athletes, it doesn't matter because rugby players and wrestlers, they're all working in this movement. And the mm -hmm. latage is excellent to give them stability. The biggest challenge, I completely appreciate Anand and Suman's point that a latage is a very difficult operation. Even after uh, you know a 10-12 year experience, we have a huge volume of latages. I'm still stressed out when I'm doing a latage. It is a very difficult operation, difficult to replicate. But the worst situation is to have a graft incorporated, latage healed, and a patient unstable. It's a very <laughs> difficult entity to solve. So I'd rather do the capsule shift and make that graft extra articular. Uh, wonderful points. Paul, there are a, um, a, a huge uh, group of surgeons in Australia and New Zealand who still do a lot of open surgery, especially for rug their rugby players. Um, open bank as their primary procedure most of the time and uh, they they have good literature to support that it, that surgery works quite well in their case. you know and when we, when we see rugby players uh from europe here they'll they'll say to me my coach wants me to have an open procedure and, and they won't want an arthroscopic procedure uh, and and i think for me when i see these american football or american rugby players who have some underlying laxity and concomitant then with a bank cart, that's going to be a primary open shift uh, bank cart repair for me. Uh, I'll skip over arthroscopy. And I won't use the ISS, but that's, it's going to play some role. Male hyperlaxity uh, is going to play some role. <clears throat> All right. Well, outstanding, outstanding discussion. I think just in the interest uh, of our East Coast uh, I mean, you know, doctors who are past midnight, uh, it might be time to throw this to uh, our most senior member, Dr. David Rajan, uh, for some closing remarks on this uh, this first conference. David. Uh, thanks, Sumant. Uh, you may not be able to see me. My camera is still not working, but you can hear me, I'm, I'm sure. Okay. It's a great privilege and pleasure to give a closing remarks in the Indian American Shoulder Elbow Society and the SESI joint webinar. Uh, the two things really strike me. One is shoulder surgeons of Indian origin all over the world are making a big mark, be it uh, US, or Canada, or uh, Great Britain. They're always there. And in the, in the limelight, there's a lot of uh, literature written by them. I'm, we are so proud of them. Number two, I'm reminded, you just mentioned, I'm reminded of those days, the 80s when and the Indian Americans like uh, Gopal and Dinesh uh, came all the way and held hands and be your mentors and uh, 
uh, came for in person meeting so many times and did surgery for us and uh, uh, the, the it is being replicated that's uh, being followed in the shoulder now and we are very happy yeah, and it's a very welcome move sesi shoulder elbow society of india was founded in 2011 very young but before that it was uh, shoulder society of india almost uh, 20 years back uh, samir nagda he, he had black hair then and uh, they <laughs> uh, twice they came and they did in person meetings in coimbatore and i think madras once and a lot of surgeries and uh, so therefore this collaboration in my opinion is uh, nothing new but uh, reinvention you can say and uh, all the best and uh, we welcome that and sesi is a vibrant young society with people like ashish uh, ram kartik and so many others uh, we have meeting every two years and the training and teaching is going on a lot of fellowships yeah, during lockdown there's um, uh, several webinars organized by ram with uh, ram as leadership and we are really going uh, great guns and even now, to that extent that now with the british elbow and shoulder society uh, recognize sasi and they are partnering in their annual uh, meeting congratulations ram thank you Uh, congratulations thank, thank you dr david rajin is a great uh, honor and privilege to have you here to give the concluding marks i think as he said uh, the sesi shoulder elbow society of india has been now officially affiliated with british elbow shoulder society so we are participating in the combined meeting the next week so we look forward to greater collaboration with the indian american shoulder elbow society and as suman is suggesting we would like to have a combined conference when the pandemic everything settle down in the future and uh, i thank everyone uh, who participated here for their time and efforts to teach the vast majority of uh, orthopedic surgeons in both countries thank you yeah i'm not finished yet just one minute yes so, please congratulations to the iacs uh, uh, yes I've, before i forget tomorrow we have a great 100th centurion uh, webinar by indian orthoscopy society and uh, dr gobalakrishnan the suman's father as well as dr patel are giving a masters of master lectures along with dr david rajan and dr anand joshi so all the viewers you know you can do not miss that yes sir david rajan sir go ahead yeah congratulate um, uh, suman samir paul ranjan anand vani and anshu and uh, so many others uh, for this great meeting and we are really proud of you because you are leading limelights in in the shoulder surgery in the us so thank you for the initiative i wish you all the very best and we'll continue to nurture and grow in this collaboration so uh, my very best wishes to each and every one of you thank you thank you thank you everyone thank Take you care. thank you bye bye thank you everyone bye thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.